south of the equator you are. Here in northwest Arkansas, we are 36 degrees north of the equator. So right here on the side of the telescope, there's a little gauge that shows 36 on it, and we're going to move the telescope by turning. Let me unlock it a little bit. We're going to move the telescope. We can raise it and lower it right there. And what we're doing is we're getting this axis aligned with the rotational axis of the Earth, which is based on your latitude. Uh, that's how much higher or lower you need to make telescope. Once that's done, you got that set, then you've got to figure out how to polar align. Well, polar aligning uh, is a skill to learn. It can be done. Paul, you got the video ready? No. Well, you, I, I told you we're going to do a polar alignment and have the video. I told you I was working on this. Paul's going to get you. I'm busy. He's busy doing things that don't directly relate to what I'm talking yes, about right now. Yes, they do. How about that? All right. All right. Fair. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Kent Martz here from Explore Scientific. Today, I'm going to teach you how to polar line your telescope using a broom. Why do you need to polar line? Well, with a telescope that has an equatorial mount, you have to get that equatorial axis lined up with the rotation of the Earth. And to do that, we're going to start with the tripod. We're going to decide which one of these legs is going to point north, and we're going to set the tripod down so that leg is pointed north. First thing I'm going to do is use a level to make sure my tripod is level. So if it's tipped one side or the other, that's going to cause your polar alignment to not be accurate. So we're going to use a level for that purpose. Then we're going to take a compass and just to make sure that I've got it pointed north, I'm going to use the compass line up and go, yep, that looks like it's pointed north. So here's what I'm going to do now. And this is where the broom comes in. The broom becomes a measurement device, if you will. So I'm going to put the broom on the ground with the tip of it right against the north leg of the tripod. And I'm going to back away, and I'm going to use the compass. I'm going to close one eye, and I'm going to use the compass to make sure that the broom is lined up with north, right? And so I can tell I'm off just a little bit. So I'm going to move the tripod just a little bit, and I'm going to turn the broom. And the broom is what I'm seeing that line with to line up. So closing one eye, now my broom is lined up perfectly to magnetic north. Right here is we're going to talk about something called magnetic declination. The magnetic north is not true north. The difference between true north and magnetic north can be off by as much as 15 or 16 degrees if you live on the east coast or west coast of the United States. Around the world, it varies. And you have to figure out what that is for where you live. Because if you point at magnetic north, you're not going to be pointing at true north. You can be off by 15 degrees. Your go-to will never be accurate. So for this system to work, you have to know what that offset is and be able to program that into your compass. We're going to provide a link to a, a, a website and a video that talks about that a whole lot more. Now, we're going to make sure that the tripod is not angled and wrong. I'm going to use a small tape measure, and we're simply going to come down here and be careful not to move the broom, and I'm going to measure the distance from the tripod leg to the center of the broom. That is 470 centimeters. That way, it is 400 and 70, a little, I'm going to call that good. Actually, I'm going to move the tripod a couple of millimeters just like that. So now we know that we're lined up true north with that leg, and these two legs are the equal, are the equal distance from right here. So it's not pushed that way or that way. So now that we have the tripod with a good alignment to north, we have to put the head on the mount. And that's going to entail this. We're going to be very careful when we do this because we don't want to move the tripod. We're going to put it on and simply screw on the polar head just like this. Remembering everything's going to the north. Now if you're in the southern hemisphere, you're going to do the same thing. You can do the same exact same in the southern hemisphere because it's not polar. It's polar alignment. We just don't use the star Polaris, which we're not using here. This is really good if you can't see Polaris or 
if it's daytime and you want to do some solo, solar viewing with a solar safe filter. So the last step of this process is to check the scale of your altitude, right? So we live at 36 degrees north, and I am going to turn the altitude until it gets to 36 degrees north. I'm going to stop, and that's it. With this system, using a broom, a compass, and a tape measure, you can achieve a good, decent starting polar alignment. Personally, I've used this, and I've got an amazingly close polar alignment. There's ways that you can use to refine your polar alignment, specifically drift alignment, but it all starts with a good polar alignment. You can do this in the daytime, you can do this in the nighttime if you can't see Polaris. It works all the time. It's a good way to get started learning the process of polar alignment. Isn't that great? I hope you've enjoyed this video. For Explore Scientific, I'm Kent Martz. Get out there and start doing astronomy. And keep looking up. There you have it. You now know how to do a polar alignment to get lined up with the north celestial pole, true north rather than magnetic north. That's the key that a lot of people miss. If you use a compass and you live on the west coast or the east coast of the United States, the compass may point north as much as 15 or 16 degrees off. So you gotta learn how to deal with that uh, error right there. So we're gonna assume we got the mount polar aligned now. And so here's how you use this equatorial mount. First off, it's got slow motion controls. This, remember the, the first one was just left, right, up, and down. You grabbed a handle, had to move it. This mount is a step up. It's got slow motion controls, and I can turn it real fast. You can see the telescope's moving right there, maybe. Yeah, there you go. You can see it moving right there, okay? And this one turns this axis. So let's talk about these different axes. axes. This axis mimics the rotation of the Earth. This is called right ascension. Don't need to know why. Just understand that this axis is how mimics the rotation of the Earth. That's the polar axis of this mount. And there's a little lock over here. It's a little knob you turn to keep it from turning by itself. Up here, this axis is called the declination axis. And it is sort of up and down, but not really. So if we want to look at something that's in the northern hemisphere, or in the north, say we want to look at uh, hmm, Polaris, we just put it straight down and just like this, and you should be able to see Polaris if you've done a good job of polar lining, you should see Polaris in the eyepiece. Let's say we want to go to, uh, oh, uh, uh, Mizar and Alcor and the handle of the Big Dipper. Let's say that it's right there. So now we're going to find it with the red dot, and you can use a star atlas or a planisphere, and we'll talk about planispheres here in a minute, here in a minute, because we've got a planisphere over in the Amazon carousel that you can pick up as well. So let's say you've got this on uh, Mizar and Alcor, and now you can simply just follow it all the way across the sky by turning the right ascension, right? And it's just going to follow that spot all the way across the sky. If you're off a little bit, it may drift in declination. Remember, this is the direct declination axis going this circle. You simply turn it and center it back up and figure out which way where you need to go to get it positioned. So it'll stay in the eyepiece a long time. Harder to learn than the Twilight Nano, where you just set it down and just left, right, up, down, point the telescope. But the equatorial mount is more powerful. It's more powerful because, like I said, once you find the object, you shouldn't have done a good polar alignment. And, you know, rough is good enough, especially starting out. You know, you've got a good rough polar alignment, start using a telescope, right? And as you get better at polar alignment, you'll find that the telescope is, the mount is easier to use. I said, rough enough is good enough. Don't let the, perfect, the quest for perfection in, in amateur astronomy or lots of other things Get in the way of good enough to start using your device. If you want to get everything perfect before you ever use it, you're not going to because it's skills you have to learn 
and you have to make little mistakes and learn from them to make you get better, right? And I've literally had people who have not who have called in with problems and questions and situations and things they didn't understand. And I finally say, have, have you used the telescope? And they'll say, no. And I say, why not? Well, because of this and that and the other thing. I say, okay, so look, it's clear where you live tonight. Why don't you just go out and use the telescope tonight? No matter what, go out and use the telescope. Because I'm telling you, close enough is good enough. Go out and use it. Don't let, and, and learn, enjoy it. See those beautiful things. Uh, see craters on the moon. See the rings of Saturn. See the planets of Jupiter move in front of your eyes. Yes, you can see. Did I say the planets of Jupiter? Ha, the moons of Jupiter. See the moons of Jupiter move in front of your eyes. If one of those moons is close to the edge of Jupiter, you can actually see it moving over five or ten minutes. It's truly amazing to see something up in the sky that you can tell is moving. So I think we have a question coming in. There we go. Uh, what telescope can I get for 350 euro? 350 euro is, or uh, that's not euro, that's uh, pound sterling. Uh, Paul, would you do a 350 pound sterling conversion? Uh, so it'd be 350 pounds to USD. It's going to be like, I don't know what the conversion rate is. I, it may be one to one. I think it may be one to one right now. Just happened. Somebody's currency was a, had gone to a one to one. Paul is over there trying to find it on his phone. Just, hey, Noah. Nope, oh, can't hear me. And he can't do it on his phone. What you got? Trying to do everything else too. Ken. I know, but what do you got for the uh, pound sterling? Three hundred fifty pounds to USD. Uh, uh, no, it's two dollars. Search for uh, pounds to USD. Pounds. pounds, like pound sterling, British money. Pound sterling to USD. Right. Well, it, it three fifty pounds is how many dollars? It's about two hundred or four hundred sixteen. So three hundred fifty pounds. So $400 conversion rate. Um, I believe it will get you all of these telescopes we're yes. looking at right now. This telescope right here we have right now, the uh, First Light. Uh, 279. 114 millimeter Newtonian on the equatorial mount is $279. This is like now, 190 pounds. Obviously, if you're talking about pounds sterling, uh, you're probably in uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, England. Uh, you know, I know there's politics Tied up in all of those, and I apologize for find any it on Amazon. Consternation, and you'll F get it from Bresser, uh, Germany, I think. I don't know if they have these or not, but a telescope like this in this range, all the ones I've been talking about are going to be within your price range. Uh, with you buy this one, you have money left over to buy a couple of other, at least one other 52 degree series Explore Scientific waterproof eyepieces, uh, and that'll still be really close or within your budget. Uh, what is the focal length of this reflector? It is 500. That was the reflector, yeah. Of this reflector, it's 500 millimeters. This is a Newtonian telescope uh, named after the inventor of this telescope, the person who also invented gravity, not discovered gravity, described gravity, talked about gravity in modern terms, Sir Isaac Newton uh, came up with this design of a telescope uh, because refractors were getting so long, he came up with a way to get a, uh, to shorten up the focal length uh, and make them much more user friendly. So 
Sir Isaac. Um, Julian, but that's just my opinion. Honestly, trying to find a local star group will be very helpful. Yes, Osmosis 007. Um, I'm not sure what Julian said, but um, if you can find a, a astronomical society, an astronomy club, whatever uh, in your area, uh, most assuredly, uh, like learning any other hobby, uh, it's much easier for you to have somebody, a mentor, to teach you how to do it. Kent equals facepalm. I have no idea. Something you said. The, oh, probably uh, uh, the planets going around Jupiter. I'll bet that's what it is here. Well, they could oh, be planets very. if you were okay. something else. Yeah, I'm going to guess that's what that was about. So, <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right, so um, so this, with this, yep. you could just go out and plop it down and Point possibly see the comet. Yeah, there's a comet, Panstars 1307 K2 or K2. something like that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that you can go out and see. It's, I believe it's in the constellation Ophicus right now, which is in the southwestern sky. Well, uh, the problem is uh, that tonight the full moon is very, very bright, and it's going to make it very difficult to see In comment. the northern hemisphere, you should be able to see it until late September. So my advice is to not try and see it tonight necessarily, unless you're just dead set on looking at the full moon and then looking for the comet. Wait three days until, or four days, Three days, the moon's going to come up well after sunset, giving you time to get the sky get dark and you see Ophicus up in the you, uh, southwestern sky. Do you uh, think it'll look anything like some of the ones in the past once the moon go away? From what my Sure Creek Astronomical Society friends were saying, if you remember Comet Neowise a couple of years ago. Or um, Hale Bob. Well, okay, no, it's not going to look like Hellbop. It will not look like Hellbop. Because that's what I have loaded. That's yeah, why. it's not going to look like that. And again, you have to remember that this is taken with a camera, right? So it's a long exposure. You can tell it's a long ex exposure because the stars have moved. No, have they moved on that one? Nope, they may be it a little bit. It says right there. Doesn't it? Uh, it was taken with a tele lens, so we know this person is probably not American. The dust tail fans out to the right while the bright, well separated blue ion tail is pointing straight away from the sun. Um, chances are this was a tracked photograph. It doesn't say what, how long it was, but it doesn't take very long for the camera to build up light. You gotta remember, your eye is operating about 1 40th of a second. That's why. If you're looking at uh, a light and it's not flashing, and you're on, in the United States, you're on 60 hertz, that light bulb is flashing 60 times because your eye stays open too long, right? If it was a shutter, so you can't see it. So you're really only seeing 1 30th of a second exposure of what's coming into your eye. So if you have a five second exposure, you're seeing, a, you're building up on the sensitive camera. Surface. There's some debate over that. Uh, okay, whatever it is, it's operating slower than one sixtieth of a second. Well, because it was faster than one sixtieth of a second, Paul, you can see the fly lights flash, and no one can. Uh, not necessarily true, because if you're going 120 frames a second, and you're watching it in real time, you, s or even 200 frames a second. It happens so rapidly, you don't see the lights flash. Correct. That's what I'm saying. It's happened so fast, you can't see it. However, if you've ever been watching a sporting event where they go in slow motion, like real slow motion, and you can see the frame getting brighter and dimmer, yeah. looks like it's pulsing, you're actually seeing the lights flash on and off. You're actually seeing that flash because the camera is going so much faster than the light is, and they play, you know, a half a second of action takes 20 seconds, you're seeing those lights flash on but and off. What's the fundamental difference between the two telescopes we've seen so far? One's a reflector and one's a refractor. One's like Captain Jack Sparrow's spyglass or 
the telescope Galileo used, uh, got to use to observe the heavens. That's what he really did first. Uh, he improved the design of a previously existing telescope, and he used yeah. it to look at the heavens. Uh, yeah. So one's a reflector and one's a refractor. One, one is just one it refracts the, the light other. into a point. This one reflects the light into a point. So they have better uses. There's the right, like you said, the right tool for the right. job. So there's different kind of hammers, right? There is no perfect telescope, just like there's no perfect hammer. If you're wanting to, to drive a uh, tax, the perfect hammer is a tack hammer. Can you do it with a jackhammer? Yeah, if you just set the jackhammer down on it and don't turn it on and turn the air on, you know, the pneumatic hammer. Um, if you're wanting to split wood uh, and beat on a, a wedge, uh, a splitting maul or a, you know, nine-pound sledgehammer uh, works well. If you're wanting to frame a house, a framing hammer is the tool to use. If you want to roof a house, a roofing hammer. They're all hammers. Heck, I've driven nails before with a pipe wrench, right? Because it's the only thing I had that would work, so I used it. The point being, there's tools for jobs, right? Every telescope is a balance. There's no perfect telescope that'll do it all. A refractor has offers high contrast views. Uh, a Newtonian uh, offers a whole lot of aperture for not a whole lot of money. Aperture, the 80 is this big, the 114 is this big. You get up to 127 millimeter refractors, 152 millimeter refractors, you know, five and six and inch refractors, they start gathering more light. Because they don't have this central obstruction, they offer higher contrast. Now, um, eyepieces can change the contrast, um, but this nice short tube makes it really nice. Uh, and this is a Newtonian telescope. I don't have one here because we don't have any in stock. But uh, and we're getting ready to in hopefully a couple months. <coughs> Excuse me. They're called Dobsonian telescopes. They're a Newtonian telescope on what amounts to a lazy Susan and a couple of well, vertical boards. Them in the showroom. With, with yeah, you can show them with some curves cut in, so it's easy to use. Those telescopes, six, eight, ten, twelve. Uh, we have some one that goes up to twenty millimeter, twenty millimeters, twenty inches in diameter. You know that's the big boy telescope. Uh, so Paul's getting up a picture of a, a Dobsonian telescope. They're called Dobsonians because after the monk in San Francisco, John Dobson, who really popularized that kind of mount. Literally, you just turn it left and right and raise the telescope up and down. It's just like that Twilight Nano I showed you earlier, just designed a little bit different, right? So... What you got? You're just gonna. You okay, to so wait. I thought you had something ready to go. Okay. <laughs> I thought no, I saw. I thought I saw, saw it, it queued time. up. So yeah. I, thought, I thought you had it queued up. So, you know, um, beginners for the bang for the buck, a Dobsonian telescope is one really good option. Uh, they can be bigger and harder to transport, which presents problems. If you have trouble lifting stuff, that presents problems too. Like I said, everything's a balance. You've got wants and needs. You've got budget and expense. You've got eyepieces. There's all sorts of other kit you can get as well. Uh, you know, that's why a kit like this to get you started out comes with everything you need to get started and then lets you uh, get on down the road and figure out what you like. Again, uh, somebody mentioned um, an astronomy club. If you can find an astronomy club, Absolutely, you should uh, start going to those meetings and meet up with a buddy. Now, this is um, the big boy. This is the 20 inch telescope, uh, Newtonian. Uh, it's a truss tube model. So it comes apart and packs up in a really small package. Uh, but most, a lot of place, uh, the entry level Newtonians have a solid tube. Think of a pipe 12 inches or 10 inches in diameter. That's a big boy right that's, there. That's 20, that's 20 inches across. That's almost two feet in diameter. That's a big telescope. But they all sort of look the same. You can't get the scale of 
the cage on that thing is literally this big around, right? You can't really get that scale. That's the same K uh, stage. It's the same everything. Yeah. That Kent was standing on when we does the uh, how to uh, uh, polar a line. Yeah. So you can imagine that size of a person when it's put together. It's really big. Yeah, I could come close to getting down inside of that. I wouldn't want to, but you can. Anyway, uh, but, you know, a 10-inch or an 8-inch or a 6-inch Dobsonian telescope, you know, it's going to be a solid tube, and it's going to be a tube about yay long. So if you don't... Uh, yay long, really long, uh, you know, maybe this tall. Uh, so it doesn't collapse down on those entry-level scopes. They're less expensive than these truss tube Dobsonians that you see. However, you know, they can be hard to transport. You've got to have a car big enough, either a back seat that's wide enough or the ability to, to fold a seat down and stick it out through the trunk into the back seat to transport it. Uh, once again, there's trade-offs for everything. Uh, Ken N, does the reflector require a coma corrector? Uh, this telescope, uh, there's no real way to hook a coma corrector on to this telescope. Uh, the reality is um, the corrector would cost more than the kit does. Uh, <laughs> coma doesn't bother me. I just, I mean, if I look at it, I can see it, but I ignore it. Uh, coma is, or field curvature, uh, is caused by, um, you know, a, a curved surface. When the light starts hitting a flat surface like a mirror, uh, like a camera sensor, that light comes in and it hits here and then it smears. And when it hits, smears on that flat surface, it creates little spikes that are called coma because the French said it, thought it looked like comets and the French word for comet is coma, and so they named it coma. So field curvature or coma are much the same thing. One's in a refractor, one's in a reflector. You know, if you buy this telescope and you've never looked at a telescope before, you're not going to notice it. You might notice it, but the human eyeball um, is, a, is also a curved surface, right? And so your eye and mind work together to, to deal with those issues. Every just, day at 1.30, Tariq. Ah, yep, every day at 1.30, unless we're running behind, and then if we're on... 2 o'clock on Amazon. Yeah, 2 o'clock on Amazon, and we're on till 3 o'clock or thereabouts. So your eye does a miraculous job of, of, and your brain does a miraculous job of fixing the coma. Some people see it, and it really bothers them, you know, um, and, but those people are almost always people who are experienced observers, and they've learned to see it, right? Or they have OCD, and it just bothers them because they know it's there. I fully understand and appreciate that situation. There's little things my OCD kicks in on and, you know, I'm compelled to do things. And I'll be honest with one of them. I've talked about it, made no secret of it, talked about it on social media. I eat things like M&Ms and Skittles and units of four. I also, um, Christopher, Christopher Hughes, just stumbled into this, going back to the beginning to catch it all. Hey, Christopher, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're here, uh, social media launch at 1.30, and then roll into Amazon Live at 2 o'clock. And this is a Amazon Live broadcast going out on, you know, the feed. So uh, we do a lot of education, talk about products, and you'll hear me say over in the carousel, that is a product on Amazon Live where you can click on and buy the products we're talking about. What a finder really do for me, Tariq. Um, not sure the question, Tariq. Tariq's in the U.S. Why would he need a finder? Why do you need a finder? Finding something in the sky, even something like the moon, can be a very large challenge. I was using an ED-80 uh, two Fridays ago at a community festival I go to and was trying to find the sun uh, manually. And um, I did it by having somebody stand down from the telescope, and I sighted along the telescope and had the sun directly above her head. And then my brother was there, and he was watching the shadows and everything. And we finally found the sun, but it took a couple of minutes to do it. Whereas if I would have had a solar safe finder, I could have done it in a few seconds. Right? So finders, uh, whether it is the red dot finder that comes with it or an add-on finder like over in the carousel you're in a CR 
ES Reflex site, and it's a uh, reflect a heads up site that projects a uh, three circles onto a uh, piece of glass, much like this red dot is projected onto the, the front lens element here. Uh, it's a zero power, it's really sharp how it works. Gonna have to find that thing. We had one in here in the studio, and it's, it's supposed gone. to be with me. Yep. It was in my orange box, and it's gone. We can't find it. Nobody Along. fesses up. Also, I'm missing a uh, extension tube. You know, it's amazing how things that are made of metal grow legs. Mm -hmm. It's weird. It's like it's like if you pop the um, accidentally pull the tail off of a lizard, it, it, it grows a new tail. Uh, Tariq, I never have any issue finding anything in the sky without a finder. Uh, I can easy, even manually, I can go to. So what the finder is really helped me for. Uh, you know, if you can find that those faint fuzzy things up in the sky, Tariq, you, you don't need a finder. It's a skill you've developed and yep. great for you to be able to do that. I, I um, can do it too. And I'm don't, it's not something that I've trained for. I just, my brain understands how to point something well, mine does at too, the star, and I can do it every time. Mine does, too, but I'm trying to find the sun with yeah. a solar filter on it. But not everybody yeah. can do that. That's just hey, everybody a has talent. Some, talent. I was going to say, everybody has a skill that they are very good at. Yeah. So while we're talking about me trying to find the sun to look at, let's talk about looking at the sun. If you have a telescope... Don't, don't do, do it. it. Period in the story. Don't do it until you learn how to do it safely. And one way of doing it is with the Explore Scientific Sun Catcher Large Aperture uh, Solar Filter. This thing right here uh, is made out of Thousand Oaks film. It comes shipped, put together, folded together. It's cardboard. Has the Thousand Oaks film, highly reflective, reflects well over 99% of the light away from the telescope. Doesn't build up heat. It's got some internal coatings in there that make it a pleasant yellow orange glow like we, the human eye, really likes. On the back side, it come, you'll have four pieces of double sided tape that are separate. You're going to peel off one side and stick it on here. And once that's done, you're going to take the four pieces of triangle foam and pull it off the tape and stick it on here. Well, the foam in here has been used so much, these won't stick on anymore, but you get the idea, right? And so you're going to stick them on there, and there's going to be four of them, and then my advice is you take the lens cap, right, and you press it down in there just like that, and you mark the plastic. Look where the little mark is, and then take a regular knife, and, well, actually how I do this is, before I stick them on, I put them in there because I don't want to cut the film, right? So I put them in where I'm going to use them. I put this on here. I mark it. I cut inside of that line. I want to make sure I have a nice, tight fit when we put this up on the telescope, right? We don't want this coming off. We want to have to work this on and squeeze it on there. If it just goes on there, like, then you have it too loose, you need to contact us and get new ones of these so we can get you fixed up. And once I have it sized correctly, uh, then I am going to pull these out, pull the double-sided tape off the outside, stick these four in place, and off I go. Now, this is going to mount right there on the front of the telescope. Now, we can safely look at the sun with this Newtonian telescope. Lining it up, I just line up the shadow until the shadow gets really sharp and crisp on the ground. And then I look through the telescope, and most of the time it's there, or I can adjust it and find it reusing the slow motion controls. That's all, all there is to it. You can we make these for every size of telescope. Uh, we don't make one for the 20 inch dob, although I guess we could if we wanted to. Uh, but yeah, we could. We could engineer one for you. Uh, but uh, very inexpensive, yet very effective and very functional. Why would you want to look at the sun? Well, there's an 11-year cycle on the sun called the solar cycle. And it goes from having no sunspots on the surface of the sun to having a whole bunch to having none. That's an 11-year cycle. Right now, we're coming out of solar minimum. We've had for a couple of years with effectively 
no sunspots, just a big round disk in the sky to look at. Now we're seeing more and more and more. Right now there's some sunspots that are naked eye sunspots. If you have solar glasses, you can go out, put your solar glasses on, look up at the sun and see the, the solar, the sunspots on the surface of the sun with no magnification. With magnification, wow, looks fantastic. With just a little magnification, uh, you can go more and more. And if you have a tracking mount, follow just individual sunspot areas. What's a sunspot? I heard you ask that. Somebody, I heard who it was, couldn't tell whose voice it was. Sunspots are areas on the sun where the magnetism gets all twisted up. So on Earth, there's a molten core uh, that creates a magnet. And, you know, the poles are just like that. The magnetic lines are well organized. Don't get mixed up. On the sun, there's no molten core that's creating the, the, the lines of magnetism like, like on Earth. And they come out all over the place. Well, sometimes they get all twisted up and tangled. Where that happens, it holds back the production of light, and that area cools off a little bit. Now, cool is relative, friends, because, you know, the surface of the sun is 9,500 degrees, you know, and the sunspot is 6,000 degrees maybe. So it's significantly cooler, but if you're standing next to it, it's still going to vaporize you because it's still super-duper hot. Now, then, if the sun was just as bright if, if, if the color of the sunspots was all over the sun, the sun would still be extremely bright. It's just that these filters cut it out and make it look dark when it's still producing a whole bunch of light uh, from that spot, just not as much as around it. Uh, the sunspots move, they grow, they change. Uh, you'll be sitting there watching the sun, and I've done this for hours, you know, sitting there at the eyepiece just watching, and you'll notice one area starts looking a little bit disturbed or funny, and you keep watching it, and you're like, does that turn dark? And over the period of 15, 20 minutes, a sunspot starts growing, and in a little bit you can see, yes, really is a new sunspot right there. And sometimes, sometimes they die out. Sometimes they become really big sunspots and grow over time. Some spots, and if you look at the sun, there's two bands where the sunspots are, are most prominent, and those bands rotate around. Some spots are so big and last so long, they'll go a couple of revolutions uh, on the Earth-facing side, so we'll be able to see the same spot, some spot a couple of three times until they finally die out. But going up into social, social, solar maximum over the next couple of years, there's going to be more and more and bigger and bigger sunspots, and you most assuredly want to be ready if you're in North America or uh, Central America, you want to be ready for the solar eclipses coming up. There's an annular eclipse in 2023 and a total in 2024. You want to be prepared for that. You want to start learning how to use your telescope to look at the sun. You want to start learning how to photograph the sun with it. Like anything else, you know, there are people who buy a telescope and it gets delivered today and they want to go out and look at the moon tonight. They may do it but they're not going to have the pleasure they would otherwise because they're going to be, especially if they've never used a telescope before, they're going to be out there struggling to make the telescope work. It's going to be very frustrating. Uh, that's really not the way to do it. You've got to start getting ready for things like that way in advance. So, all right, rolling up on 3 o'clock here on Amazon Live. If you are watching this out there in Amazon Live land and have never uh, click that follow button and you like what you're seeing, the education we're doing, uh, we would be honored to have a follow from you. We appreciate it very much. And that follow uh, makes, helps the Amazon algorithms. Uh, the more that people follow us, the more people get served our content uh, without having to stumble on it. And that's a good thing uh, because we try really hard to do a lot of education, not just push product, push product, push product. So, Today's Wednesday. Tomorrow, we're going to have On the Wing. We'll be talking about birds and birding and things like that. Uh, Friday will be First Light Chronicles and Roll Back into Money. Monday, where... Friday is Focus on Astrophotography. What'd I say? Astrophotography. Yeah, okay. Focus on Astrophotography is Friday. And then we roll into next week's programming. Uh, we try to go live on social stream at 1.30 and then on Amazon Live at 2. Go for an hour and there you go. So on behalf of Paul Newton over in the control booth, thank you, Paul, for your work today. Uh, Noah Menard, Marketplace Menard over 
keeping the Amazon and other platforms up and running and current and correctly priced and inventory correct. And everybody else here in the Explore Scientific family in Springdale, Arkansas, I am Kent Barnes. I bid you a great day. Thank you for blessing us with your time. Bye-bye, everybody. Everybody, Kent Martz here. Good Monday afternoon, evening, whatever it is for you. Heck, there's some people. It's Tuesday morning. Thank you for joining us today on the social media warm up for our Amazon live broadcast. Today is How Do You Know? And today we're going to start off with a pair of binoculars. Now, this is a great pair of binoculars. These are colorful, obviously. They're six by 21, six millimeter, excuse me, six power eyepieces, 21 millimeter objective lenses, uh, has glass lenses, a, an adjustable diopter so you can focus on your left eye and then fine tune it for your right eye so both eyes are in focus. And this is a pair of kids binoculars. Now, these things are very affordable and these are real binoculars. I am advocating if you've got a kid in your life and you want to do some birding or uh, go out and look at butterflies or astronomy, whatever, get a pair of these for yourself and get a pair for that kid in your life and go out and do use the same binoculars they're using so you're seeing the same things so you can describe how far away things are and things like that. These are the Bresser Kids Specialized Binoculars. Comes with a neck strap, a real handy neck strap. Has uh, safety clips on it so if they get pulled on real hard, if, if the kid or you get hung up on something, it's going to pop off and not strangle you or hook you up on something. It's nice and a safety feature here. Uh, made out of metal. A, the yellow is sort of a rubberized material. Uh, the red is a, a metal. Very good pair of binoculars here, uh, especially for them. They're not waterproof, so you don't want to take them swimming or anything. But I really like this pair of uh, Bresser 6x21 kids binoculars. Now we're going to roll on into something else. This is a new product for us. It's over there, out there on our website, explorescientific.com. It's also over on our Amazon page. And this is a warm up for that uh, broadcast. This is the Star Maker video kit. I'm unpacking it as you can see. I didn't have it ready to go. I forgot to take it out of the box. And there we go. And we'll just make the box go away. Hey, this thing is charged up and ready to go. How about that? You can spin this around here with the uh, 300 or 270 degree camera. This is a fantastic device. You can see it right there. And you can see my face right there so you can see what you're getting in the shot. Just like that. This is a really cool device. It's for ages eight and up. It's so you can, kids can learn, and adults can use this too, how to, let me turn it off, figure out where the off button is. There we go. It's a great little 1080p HD camera. Has an inch and a quarter screen so you can see it. Has a built in microphone, built in camera. <coughs> there you go. There's my first sneeze. Um, we'll get a couple more for the day is over with. Spin this around so you can see it a little bit, the, the front of it. You can put on an external 
microphone. It's got face detection, so it'll focus on the faces in it. Uh, you can record up to an hour and a half or more of video. Uh, it'll also run for uh, an hour and a half on one charge. It comes with a handy tripod that also serves as a, you can raise it up, right? Or you can lower it a little bit, or you can use it as a selfie stick, right? There you go. You can use it as a selfie stick. So, uh, you got some young ones in your life, or you want to play with make a video on an affordable platform, this is the route to do it. A really handy tripod, a 1080p HD camera. Uh, it comes with a 16 gigabyte card, and it goes up to 64 gigabyte. Now I'm going to be make sure I'm going to make sure that's 16 gigabyte. Now, last time I took this out, it shot across the studio, but managed to get it out. Yes, it's an 8 gigabyte card. Excuse me, an 8 gigabyte card. Sorry about that mistake. I'm going to make sure I get it in there. I'm going to cover my hand because, boy, it shot out. We found it, though. It comes with a nice light you can turn on so you can do a bright light, a dim light, or a strobe light effect right there on this handy magnetic base sign or magnetic base. You can also, a little screw hole, you can mount it on a wall. And look at that. It's got a good enough magnet. It will hold it in place just like that comes with a USB cable so that you can charge the camera with this or you can plug this in and download your video segments uh, without taking out the SD card or you can put the SD card in a computer and take it out that way. Also comes with a clapboard so you can create right down the scenes that you're going to video record, get it at the very start of the video that makes it easier to locate the scenes that you want to get and when you're there to, ready to start editing you can find them easier. Now this does not come with an editing program. You're going to have to pick a editing program on the computer you're going to use and download it but it allows you to do regular just like uh, they do in the real movies. Action and off you go. It also comes with a green screen, blue screen so you can play with chroma screen. Chroma screen is where you take the background that is a uniform color, in this case blue or green, and you can put whatever you want to back there. Magic swirls, paisley, video from something else. This allows you start kids to start working on their video editing, recording, and storytelling skills. We all know uh, how important video has become, and this gives your kids a jump start on learning the skills they're going to need that's going to be important for the rest of their lives as they do uh, video on their social media platform of choice in the future. Uh, who knows what's going to come around when, you know, 8 or 10 year old is 14, 15, 16. Hard to say what platform they're going to be on, but if they want to get a great start, this is a great way to do it. The Star Maker Video Kit comes with everything you need to get started, including a camera, tripod that serves as a selfie stick, the 8 gigabyte card that will get you up to an hour, more than an hour and a half of video, uh, the camera that runs on an uh, hour and a half on a full charge, the camera head swivels so you can change the angle and still see what's on the 1.3 inch screen, the video clapboard, the light, USB cable, and the chroma screen. So that is the Star Maker Video Kit a new product from us. It's been selling well and I expect it to be a really popular item. If you want to be the hero gift giver, uh, come a birthday or Christmas, by golly, I think this will be the ticket to make you the hero gift giver. So, moving along, let's talk about microscopes a little bit. So, Kent. So, Paul. I forgot because I was trying to fix the 24-hour feed. Did, to... did, did you break it? No, we're... <sighs> you broke it. There's always it. something. You broke that it. The instructions don't tell you. You broke it. No, it's not broken. It's not broken. It's just not working. I know. Hey, no, can I don't you come understand why. It doesn't please? make any sense. So <sighs> are, are we not streaming 24-7 right now? 
we're gonna we we've been streaming all weekend, but I'm uh -huh. trying to put a piece of media in there that lets me stream 36 hours to 72 hours worth of content, so you don't have to watch the same thing twice, right? right? Which would be nice. Unless you want to stay up for three days and do it. Yeah, I'm not here, so. Um, but I shot new video for the, that, uh, the, the, the Star thing. Maker. The Star Maker. And the V8 engine. And the V8 engine. If I can get it to pull up. But Everything is slow, man. Well, it's Monday. I don't the, know what the, the weekend The gerbils are still overhung from their long well, weekend. So I'm going to move on. While you're over the, there banging away. Oh, it's okay. What's the uh, number on that thing that you got there? On the Star Maker? No, the thing in your hand. The Explorer 1 28 binocular microscope. No idea what the skew is. You're supposed to know these things. <sighs> no idea, my friend. Well, why not? Because I, I just don't have this skew memorized. <laughs> That's nobody, why. I mean, there might be some people watching. I can't tell if there's anybody watching, though. I don't. I, got, I guess. We got three, four people watching right now. They're not saying anything. Hey, say something. Paul doesn't believe you're out there. He thinks you're bots. Bots? Not really. All right, so this is the Explore One binocular microscope. It's 20 power. So Paul's got some pictures that we took through one of the eyepieces uh. showing a penny and a bug and some other stuff. The penny really gives you an idea of what 20 power looks like. You always ask for the penny, and you know all I have is the feet. You have the penny. You use the penny, Paul. I've used been looking the for it. You're going to have to hey, send it to me again. It's, 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 it's Abraham Lincoln. Abraham it, Lincoln? Yes, absolutely. He's a, he's a cool-looking babe when he's in copper. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, his head you fills up I the eyepiece. Sir? You know I don't have I haven't you had have it, for it. Like three or four weeks. You have it. You just can't find it in your uh, hodgepodge, jumbled up. You want to come massive, and do this? massive database of files in your computer yeah, system. I, I only have like ten <sighs> terabytes over here. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. I can get you the B though. The B. So that's a. Bumblebee slash Carpenter Bee. I think it's probably a Carpenter Bee. I think it's more interesting than the, than the penny. Yeah, myself. but nobody knows. You can't get a scale for the size well, of what yeah, the magnification does. Everybody knows what a bee is. No, it's not a bee. Bumblebee Bee? It's, it's, a, it's a Carpenter Bee. No, it's or a, a Bumblebee. Bumblebee. Bumblebee Bee. Right, but still, much easier to show an American penny so they can What if see. they're not American? Well, it's... They, they still have an idea of what size it is. <laughs> you like, just, like this it can, is the kind of stuff you do to me, you know. Oh, I know. Absolutely. <laughs> so, anyway. So, Nancy M. says, howdy. Howdy? howdy. She says, howdy. Howdy. Who was it? Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for the howdy. So, this microscope is a little different than a lot of microscopes and one we're actually going to look at. This does not have light that shines up through specimens, and you see very, very, very narrow slices of that, so you can see all the little intricate pieces in the inside of it. No, this microscope has light that shines down, reflects off of the object, and then back into uh, the microscope. As you can see, there's a B. It also comes with this sample of rocks that you can look at, which, amazingly, the rock, rocks under magnification look pretty cool. You can see things in the magnification that you can't see when you're just looking at it with your eyes. It's pretty cool. Also comes with a bunch of prepared Why slides. Why don't you like the bee? I didn't say I, I took the picture of the bee. I think the bee's fine. I just think the American penny gives them... You got something against bees? No, I have something against half dollars. <laughs> you don't have against half dollars? They're not whole dollars. So, comes with a sample of glass slides human sperm, fly head, a bunch of other stuff. The fly head is actually a whole stinking fly. You won't be able to see it, but under the microscope, man, it's pretty cool looking. Now, 
You could use these on a on a standard um, microscope where you have uh, you know uh, uh, light coming up through it. But these are thick specimens. But the cool part about it is you can see in three dimensions because you're using your eye, and it's just when you go over and see the veins and the limbs, you can see the squished body. You can see the mouth parts hanging out there. You can see hairs. Just a fantastic little microscope. I would have loved to have had this mic microscope when I was say, hey, Annie. Hello. Come on, join us, will you? Annie just walked in the studio, and as most of you know that are regulars, when you watch the show and you walk through, you got to come up here on the screen. Hey, Annie, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Sitting here talking about microscopes. Well, yeah, Lucy and I play with this all the time. Have you looked at these rocks? Oh, they're cool, aren't they? They're so cool. Yeah. They look completely different this under was, a microscope. This one right here was really hard to see because it's white. So Put it, it in really, there. Let me take a look at it. It was really, really... Well, you got to turn off the light. It was really difficult to see. What do I have to turn off the light for? Because the lights in the studio because are Because the too lights bright. in the studio are too bright. It is indeed very it difficult very to difficult. see. It's very difficult to see. I'm going to go to a flat oh my side. Gosh, I forgot I had my sunglasses on. Sorry. I look like I just came in. Ow. <laughs> Here, let me bounce it for you. Boop, 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 boop. No, you can see if you get the flat side. Here's a flat side. It's pretty cool. Now, then turn the lights on because it makes it, you can like see a little bit of like luminescence or something. I don't know what you call it. But. Fluorescence. Look at that. That is very cool. Does the floor have essence? I know, it's like rainbow colored. Isn't that so cool? You got your phone on you? No. Huh? We're going to try and take a picture real quick. I can't take a picture. I don't, I don't have my phone. Where's your phone? On my desk. No. Do you want me to go get my phone so you can take a picture of it? Yeah, let's try it. Show I will be back. So, I would have loved to have had this microscope when I was a teenager because... It's just so very cool, right? This is uh, the different colors of light that you can see in here. It's like the rock turns the lights into a rainbow. I'm trying to get a hold of it and get it moved. Boy, there it is. Because you can't see your fingers. And when we turn on the light for the microscope, it basically just disappears. Because we're looking at such bright lights in the studio. And it'll be back with my phone. And I will take a picture. And then we'll send it to Paul via the magic of the internet. And then through the wonders of all his little switches and everything. He will be able to show you what this looks like. He'll be able to say, take a picture live and do this live. Never thought about this before. But anyway, thanks everybody for joining us. Give us a shout out. We would love to see you. Uh, give us a hello so we can give you a hello back. That's not oh. phone. God, you're killing I said, me. I said, do you want me to go get my phone? Okay, use that eyepiece because that's the one I've got in focus. Listen, lights, camera, action. That's the one I've got in focus. So I'm going to hold <sighs> it. Let me, let me hold it. I'm too short. And I want you. Short. No, you. Don't touch the table. Okay, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Let me. Let me. No, it's not going to work. Yes, it is. Why don't you put? Why don't you put a um, a uh, telescope uh, camera? Tap it. Take a picture. Tap it. Focus it. There we go. Ooh. Oh gosh, is that me? No, it's me. Oh gosh. Is it hard? There it is. There it is. It's great television. By Tap the it way. in the middle. Focus oh. it. And then send this is it. how you take a photo with a microscope. Tap it again. Hang on. You keep getting in the way. I'm not in the way. It's the shims. It's really hard when my phone is really dirty. All right, send one of those to Paul. Pick one that looks good and send it to Pauly. Send it to Pauly. Pauly. Oh, nice. Let me see it. Yeah, so maybe you blow it up a little bit, stretch it, and then just take send a it to shot. me. Don't do anything to it. <laughs> just send it to me. Let me do don't that. Touch it. All right, we got to do what the boss says until we don't. Do what I say. So, so how did you get that open so easy? I couldn't get these open last time. I'm a professional. 
Yeah. There we go. I got it. I got it. All right. So, anyway, we'll get that picture up in a few minutes. Going to move along to another microscope. Here we go. We're going to switch. And then we'll come back and show you what. We'll switch back. When we go to Amazon Live, we'll have it up on Amazon Live. Ay, ay, ay. Ay, ay caramba. So, here we go. This is the discovery. 400X to 900X microscope. I think it's 400? 100X to 900X microscope. As you can see, it comes with a nice uh, hard-sided keeper case in it. The microscope, a hatchery, not for chickens, but shrimp. And not you shrimp, could, but brine can, shrimp. Sir? Can you get chickens that small? Those would be ultra bantams or toy bantams or something. No, you can't get chickens that small. <laughs> Hey, there's Daniel. Come on over here, Daniel. Daniel. He ain't going to do he it, He flicked man. at me like, you're crazy, kid. He ain't going to do it, man. Uh, has a Petri dish, a sample maker right here, prepared slides, beakers, uh, tools to manipulate your, your samples, red dye, blue dye. Now, I'll tell you this, that red dye and blue dye, that's food-grade dye, not poisonous. If your kid drinks it, all it's going to do is turn their mouth and tongue blue or red and if they drink it together it's going to make brown or purple one or the other uh has sea salt and brine shrimp eggs brine shrimp i always saw those in like boys life magazine and places like that known as sea monkeys now they're just brine shrimp so, I, so i've always tried to see the monkeys but it never could there's they don't even look like monkeys why did they come up with that it's just marketing, my friend. Marketing. You know, which monkey did you like? None. Are, are the monkeys a real rock group? Should they be in the no. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? They are not a real band. But they were. They came. They wrote their own songs and played their no. own instruments? No, no, no. Just because was, they were formed no. for TV doesn't mean they're not a no. real band. No. Yeah, so you're rock and roll pure. So El Elvis Presley, no. he wasn't a band. No, he was a man. But, okay, but Peter Tork was a man. Wrote songs, sang them, played them. The monkeys influence was a rock band. The monkeys, everything you heard was a society. session musician. No, they went on. They toured. They, yeah, they toured. But when you listen to them on the record, or if you listen to them Paul, on Paul. the TV show, those were session Paul. musicians. Glenn Campbell played on hundreds of number one hits. Yes, so did Willie have, Nelson. Have you ever have you ever seen the uh, documentary, uh, the session? What's it called? Uh, uh, about Testoro, um, his son did it. The, about the Wrecking Crew, bands would come in and go, "We need to play our own songs." They're going, "You can't do this," and they would watch guys like Glenn Campbell and all those guys who are on the Wrecking Crew uh, do their work, and they go, "Yeah, I can't do that." Uh, they were those people were good musicians, but they didn't have the skills that the Wrecking Crew had. Like the Beach Boys, for instance, the Beach Boys didn't record a, some of their own music. They used session musicians. That doesn't mean they don't belong in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but the monkeys do. The sea monkeys may not, but the, the monkeys, I believe. Daniel, should the monkeys be in the Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? He doesn't know who they are. Do you know who they are, Daniel? He doesn't know who the monkeys are, so he can't vote. If you don't know, I you was can't just vote. A little, I was a baby. You're <sighs> lucky I remember it. You were a wee little tyke. So oh, this even. is the discovery... 900x uh, microscope. This is a microscope just like you think about a microscope being. You take a slide. Where did the case go? Oh, I set it down. You take one of the prepared slides. The person to ask about the monkeys is Noah. <laughs> He's like, no, leave me alone. The, band ha the, the monkeys had a huge influence on society. Therefore, they deserve to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for the influence they had. On society. John Lee Hooker needs to be in there then, too. You can make that good argument. So, I have a prepared slide. This is Hydrilla verticillata leaf. I pronounced that middle that word wrong. Not correct. V E R T I C I L L A T A. Verticillata. See, osmosis is crazy. So, here we go. Osmosis says monkeys are the best of the British invasion. Say again. 
<sighs> what do you say? Uh, you're going to make me say that again. It's yes. heresy. It's heresy. It's <laughs> Osmosis007 uh, says the monkeys were the best of the British invasion. Say, hey, we're the monkeys. We don't even make our own music. They did. No. They did. <laughs> Look it up. So here we go. Here we go. Talking about this microscope for just a wee Ooh. little bit. What time is it, Paul? It, we are going on Amazon in like a minute. Oh, okay. So I'm going to do a quick reset. We will come back yeah, and redo re what I just did did. Do did. What you did done. What I did I done. I'm just going to change the We'll name. start over. So we need... How do you know? So, how do you know? Back in a minute, folks. Oh, can't. Can't, can't, can't. No, Jamie Hyman. Hello, everybody. Now, I think that on. guy in the warm-up that punches the screen looks a lot like Jamie Jamie, Jamie Heineman. If he was from, like Indian, from MythBusters, one of the if cool he was Indian, maybe shows. that guy's not Indian. Yeah, he was negative. Let's see. Hang on. We have to look at it again. You're talking about subcontinental Asian Indian, not not native, American native Indian, Native American. No. Not Native American. Yeah. Nothing's happening, Paul. I'm working on it. It takes you so long to do things, well, Paul. It's crazy. So, hey, while he's doing that, hi, right. everybody. Welcome Let's to... Let's change, then. You come over here and run the stuff. And I was born in the 80s, had a good upbringing. I graduated college in the 80s, and I had a good upbringing as well. So, I was listening to Molly Hatchet. Thank you very much. I have no problem with you listening to Molly Hatchet. You're welcome very much. <laughs> so, here's he's getting a picture of that fella. So, here we go. All right. The, today is Monday, which makes it How Do You Know Monday. And um, how do you know what time it is? Well, you use a clock, of course. And what better clock to use <laughs> than... How do you tell what time to use a clock? Well, you could also use Siri these days. You can use Siri these days, but Siri is hey, not Siri, a... Hey, Siri, what time is it? Siri may have a beautiful voice, but Siri does not hang up on your wall, though. <laughs> Siri does not hang up on your wall, though, like this I, beautiful I Siri, scientific um, analog clock. Well, it may be an analog clock. It also sets its time automatically. It's an atomic clock with WWVB, the federal government's... Uh, broadcast that's good for setting uh, atomic clock devices in North America, including Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Over in your carousel today on Amazon Live, you can pick this up. Not sure of the price. It's a beautiful clock. Uh, if you're an Explore Scientific fan, what, what way to better celebrate to celebrate than putting 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 this clock putting in your um, did you say pudding? Uh, man cave, office, or whatever. That way, you can always answer the question, how do we know what time it is? Well, I'm going to look at the $39.95 uh, retail Explore Scientific clock. Very fantastic looking thing. Uh, ooh, there's a coupon. Where? On Amazon Live? Yeah, let's see. see where the there's a coupon on Amazon Live. How about that? Yeah. So go to the carousel. How do you get to it, Noah? Go to the carousel. You click on the items, the clock. And once you go there and look at the uh, buying options, it'll show you the coupons for 20% off. Woohoo, sweet. So you go to the carousel. You click on the item, 
go to the cart and it gives you see all buying options and click on it and there you go it comes I up guess with he's a not Indian. save he's an extra 20 percent save an extra 20 percent by clicking on the coupon and adding it to the cart that way so you can save 20 percent on everything or just select items that, that item. just that item okay very good just that item so Shifting gears to a new item Explore Scientific has come out with. This is the Star Maker Video Kit. The heart of the system is this nice, compact, yet very powerful digital camera. This is, uh, produces video in 1080p HD. It holds a, comes with an 8 gigabyte card that will hold uh, more than an hour and a half of video. That's a lot of video. It'll take up to a 64 gig card. Now that that's a lot of video right there. It has a nice 1.3 inch screen. I can make it come on real quick. Uh, hit the correct button and there we go. It's the Explore One. This camera has a swivel head so it swings around backwards and now, I don't know if you can see that or not. Can, can you see me there, Paul, on that little 1.3 inch screen? Is that visible? Hang on. Hang on. Paul's going to maybe do a digital zoom right there. There you go. You're Hi, squished. everybody. Yeah, I'm squished. There you can see it. See, it's me waving, not there. Hey, great little camera. So if you're wanting and have to learn how to do some video or, and get started, you can use the StarMaker Video Kit. It's for ages 8 and up comes with a tripod as you can see that the camera mounts on or will fit in your pocket and you can use it handheld. The tripod extends up to 23 inches and here's something cool. You can turn it into a selfie stick right there. Now I'm doing the selfie stick as we speak right there. Pretty cool. I'm going to turn it off just to save the batteries. It also is a camera. It takes I believe up to six different sizes of pictures. When you're shooting video, it has a uh, face tracking technology. The head doesn't move, but it keeps the face in focus, so it can ID faces as well. Comes with, put this back down, comes with nice little light that's magnetic, sticks well to the base, so you can put it on a table and use it to, to provide a studio light if you need some light. You can hang it on a wall and rotate it so it shows uh, the light where you want it. It has a bright mode, a dim mode, and a strobe light effect right there. So cool. Also comes with a USB cable so you can hook the device straight up to your computer and on it to pull the recorded video out of the SD card or you can remove the SD card, put it in your card reader. Once in your computer, you're going to use your favorite editing program. This does not come with an editing program to edit your video into your story. Now, it also comes with a handy clapboard so you can action when you start a recording. Easy to use some chalk to write uh, information on the clapboard so that you can set the scene, record this at the very start of your scene so it makes it easier to find your video when you get into editing and start going through and picking out the ones you want. You know what the scenes are, right? Easy to start and stop with the button on front. This also comes with a chroma screen. It's a blue-green chroma screen. Blue on one side, green on the other, right here. So what's chroma screen? It allows you to put in artificial backgrounds. If you want to put in a paisley background or a picture of Paul back there uh, acting like a, a, a hmm, what we act like? Uh, a director. That's what acting like a director back in the background, and you work in front of him on the green yes, screen. Yes, I just act. You like a can do that. It's a cool technique that you can. Well, you're not a monkey, or a director, or yeah, you're a director, but you're not a monkey. So you can uh, connect or connect. You can learn to use the chroma background to add special effects, just like the people do on TV. If you watch The Weatherman, also a lot weather forecasters, the meteorologists, don't mean to say weathermen, Weather and forecast. additionally, a lot of these videos you see where people are doing tricks and stuff, and uh, they're using green screen and editing in the background, so you don't see uh, what's really going on in a lot of those videos. So, this is the Star Maker 
video kit from Explore One, an Explore scientific brand. If you want to be a hero gift giver this year, and you've got somebody that's interested in doing this, right here is the ticket to being the hero gift giver in your family. So, shift into microscopes a little bit now. This is the Explore One 20 power binocular microscope. Paul, did you get that picture from Annie we took a little while ago? Uh, she has not sent it to me that I can see. No. She has not sent it to me. Well. It is not my fault. Do why don't not you, try and blame I'll, me. I'll switch to the other one. And why don't you Skype her or text her and ask her to send that. Or is get that up and go cup ask or her. Is that cause, her cup? Because I want to see that, sir. I want our customers to see that beautiful fluorescent crystal in there. This is the Discovery 900 Power, 900X, Biologic Microscope. As you can see, it comes with this nice hard case uh, with a clear plastic cover that allows you to keep all of your kit. Brian Shrimp. Hey, no. To Paul, ASAP, please. We're still going. Okay, it's we're still going. So Windows you crash. can make your own uh, slides, very thin slices of stuff, using the slip covers and the blank slides that are in here. As a Petri dish, comes with blue and green dye. And I'll tell you right now, that blue and green dye is food grade dye. If your kid drinks it, their tongue is just in mouth, is going to be blue or red. Or if they're doing both, it's going to be probably brown or purple, one or the other. But I can tell you, uh, things may come out blue and red, too. So there you go. What? Uh, salt crystals. So you can do sea salt experiments and grow salt crystals. And the ever popular brine shrimp, I knew them as sea monkeys from reading the Boy's Life magazine. You can hatch out and these brine shrimp where, and watch their life cycle. Sir? This is where we all of a sudden went off into a tangent about the monkeys, the TV show. Yes, the monkeys on the TV show. Paul asked for what the monkeys were, and I said they're a rock band from the 60s, a pop rock band that should be in the Hall of Fame. I didn't but ask isn't. what the monkeys we, were. We I said, argued. are those monkeys? They don't look like monkeys. They certainly don't look like Peter Tork. God. But they're brine shrimp. They can uh, survive for decades in a state of dryness and dryness. And it sounds sort of Irish or something there. Or they oh, can uh, get wet and come to life and go through their life cycle. Comes with some tweezers, a couple of vials, a beaker, some probing tools. And let's now talk about the heart of the system the microscope itself. So, the microscope can go from 100 to 400 to 800 power, and that happens by turning the turret right here. If you look, there's a short lens, a medium lens, and a long lens. The short lens is the lowest magnification. When you're going to focus on this, always start out with the lowest power magnification, whether it's a telescope or a binocular or anything else. Start out with the lowest power you can, that makes it easier to find. I don't think these pictures turned out. There was one of them that looked real good. No. That's why you need to put them in Photoshop and sharpen them and deal with the colors. I could do all that here, and it's not. Well, we'll go on if you don't come up with one. Anyway, so... How this works is you have a slide, really thin piece of biologic material. In this case, it's the piece of a water plant, right? A hydrilla verticellata. I know I'm pronouncing the second I'm word selling. wrong. It's the best I can do. So it goes into the stage, Push which is where where the, where the things go. And there's a hole in there that light Push comes it up forward through. about four inches. <laughs> ah. Is that Keep good? Going. Huh? Keep going. Okay, so it comes with an LED that turns on, and it spins this around. When you rotate it to up, the
the LED comes on. So I'm going to put the LED so it's shining the light up through it. I'm going to back up a little bit so I can focus on it. And now I'm going to focus the microscope all the way down so I know it's all the way close. From experience, I know that this comes into focus extremely quickly, right? Very, very quickly. What happened? Turned the light off. Batteries did? No, I just turned it off. Just use the lights in the room, Ken. And so... Use the mirror. I can now... It has a mirror on it. Start just for focusing. This Let's just see if the mirror is any brighter. Oh, yeah. Even I can tell. No, no. Yeah, you're not different. even close to it. You had it a second ago. No, I can see it. There. No, go back the other way. There it is. Oh. You're not looking at the microscope, knucklehead. Yeah, but I can see where the mirror is reflecting on. Luckily, these are nice plastic uh, slides, so when I just pushed it open and couldn't see what I was doing because they had my glasses on, didn't break anything, right? It's always good not to break stuff. So, going to go something not quite as thick. This is red, and so I'm going to start looking for red. Red, red, red. Get the light on. There we go. Now then I'm just going to move the slide a little bit because I found it. I think the batteries may be dying in this. Wow. Pretty cool looking. So, it looks like a little prisms almost. These come to focus really quick, as in you barely start turning it and it gets into focus. And people oftentimes go right past it and they don't realize... They're turning the knob too fast. Turn the knob really, really, really slowly. That will help you get it in to focus. This is a great way to get into microscopes and learning about the different parts of cellular level uh, plants and animal stuff. Once you have it in focus and the subject that you want centered up, you can turn the turret and go up to nine, 100 power and then get it in focus and then you can turn the turret again and go up to 1000 power that, or excuse me, 900 power that gets you the uh, um, highest power using the longest lens on the turret. Now this also comes with a wheel right here that changes the color and I'll show you what it looks like because I have one off of one that was that we took apart for parts, it has a clear circle. You can see a green circle, a red circle, and a blue circle. I've got to lower it a little. Ah, sorry. And then back it up a touch. There you go. So you have a blank circle, a green circle right here. An empty circle. Yeah, not blank. It's an empty circle, just white light. The green filter, the red filter, the blue filter another empty circle, and then some much smaller holes if the light's too bright. What's the purpose of these color filters? The purpose of these color filters are when you change the color of the light going through your sample, your biologic sample, it changes the contrast and changes what you can see. It highlights other colors and takes out some colors so you can see different pieces of the cells as you're using the uh, Discovery 900X biologic microscope as it comes with five prepared slides and seven blank slides. You can use those to make your own samples. It comes with a downloadable uh, experiment guide that tells you how to execute uh, growing the brine shrimp, growing the salt crystals, how to cut your own samples and dye samples and things like that. Gets you down to a really cool uh, process of learning how a microscope works and becoming a junior biologist uh, with this fantastic starter microscope right here. And let me turn the LED off. I think we're going to put new batteries in this because I think these batteries have been on a while. I didn't tell you, tips like this so you can find, let me see if I can do this. I bet I can get some brighter light up in there. Tipping it way back like this. Let's see here. Gonna look through. Let me go to the lowest eyepiece because you always want to start, no matter what, with the lowest power eyepiece.
And nope, not getting anything. Nothing. Nothing coming through. That's all you right. You want me to try it? Nope. We're going to go on down the road and look for something else. Up. I always end up figuring it out when you guys don't. You know I'm not worried I mean? about it. It comes with an LED. Put a battery in it. It's bright. It works well. This is dim. I'm going to say the battery's got left on. And you know what happens when that happens? Things die. All right. So let's talk about a pair of binoculars. I love these little binoculars. These are the Bresser 6x21 binoculars. They, it means they have a 6 power eyepiece on them and a 21 millimeter objective lens size. Now, these are colorful. They're fun colored. The uh, orange or red is made out of metal. The yellow is sort of a rubberized gripping surface, comes with a neck strap. The glass elements in here, the lenses that make these work are glass. They're not plastic. You can focus it for your left eye. It has a diopter just like real binoculars, and I do that in air quotes because this is the Bresser Specialized Kids Binocular. It says kids, but I'm telling you, these are the real deal binoculars. I advocate, you got a kid in your life and you want to introduce them to birding or astronomy or uh, learning how to use them for sports or whatever, buy a pair for your kid in your life and buy a pair for yourself and go out and use the same binoculars they're using. These are great binoculars uh, over there. We got a question. Hi, Kent and Paul. That's from Tariq. Uh, hello, Tariq. Uh, Scott is in the building, although he's tied up doing something all afternoon. Um, I think he's getting ready, working on getting uh, for the global star party tomorrow night. We got another question coming up. Aquilus started following. Hey, Aquilus, thank you very much for that. We appreciate it immensely by uh, following us. You get to see more of a great content. Tariq, I am saving to buy a cheap 152 scope from somewhere later next month, hopefully. But when I get a budget soon, I will buy a second 90 millimeter triplet scope. Tariq, you gotta have uh, gotta have goals, right? Uh, none of this is uh, none of this is you know. Uh, he, Tariq lives in so we've certain got a, parts of the world. It gets to be parts of the world. It gets to be. But I'm holding it till we get to a particular section, which will help him with the answer. Okay, which section do we want to get to? Well, I'm looking at you know it's a telescope question. Oh, okay, so all right. So uh, on the telescope, Oculus says your channel is great. I love this. Thank you, Oculus. Do you like Oculus us fighting for? Because um, we just really uh, just banter and yeah, so kick each you know, other. Yes, with words. this is a sales channel uh, through Amazon, but we uh, also love to do a lot of education and trying to get people to understand how things work and why things work. Yeah. Uh, we I, I, I got really enjoy once. doing that, sir. I got kicked off here once. By who? You. Oh yes, absolutely. You're getting ready to kick off again, too, if you don't watch it, bub. All right, so uh, if you're just watching us on Amazon Live, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're working in the uh, astronomy, birding, uh, educational toy section. Uh, we don't really have anybody else who's doing this. If you, if you notice on the screen, my forehead looks red. That's because yesterday I went out picking wild blackberries and uh, forgot to take a hat with me. And by the time That's I awful. realized it, I didn't want to walk back to the truck and... I burned the top of my noggin just a little bit. It's so awful late in the season to pick wild blackberries. No, they're just starting, man. No, they're I've already we've the, already collected all of ours. No, the, oh, there's tons of them up at my farm in Pea Ridge. There's tons of them. I mean, we we collected two gallons. <laughs> Here you go. Two gallons of blackberries. I have the scars on my arm from all the thorn pricks. My dad used to have to fight the cows for them. Listening to you to banter back and forth is like witnessing a Wisconsin Thanksgiving. Well, <laughs> I guess happily, Osmosis 007, I have never witnessed a Wisconsin Thanksgiving. Probably that's a happy thing for me. So <laughs> the specialized 6x21 binoculars from Bresser, 
get yourself a pair, get yourself a pair for your kid in your life, go do astronomy, go do birding, and get them happy. Most kids just want to spend time with you, right? Or they don't want to spend any time with you, one or the other. All right, so we're going to move into the telescope segment. This cool. is the first light Newtonian. First light is a uh, uh, brand from Explore Scientific. Uh, first light means, you know, the first time you use a telescope, the first time you look through something, that's the first light for that telescope. Uh, this telescope brand was designed and promoted and really starts as a, as a starter scopes for people, therefore it's first light as well. So um, this is a 114 millimeter telescope, which means where the light goes in, which is right here, if I can get this off, take off that little, get stuck on there. That I will make sure he gets all the questions when he's ready. Because one of the things that Kent doesn't like is me interrupting him as you look at him right now while I'm talking, I'm telling looking, you. I'm looking for the comment. Normally, you just wave your hands and point at your eyes, and I know there's a comment Well, coming. no, Tariq wants me to ask the question now, but I am letting you finish your spiel. Ah, well, it's 114 millimeters in diameter. Paul, you got a question there, I hear. Well, Tariq was not first. I don't care which one you give me, Paulie. <laughs> Mr. Connor Bradley. Hi, I have an issue up. with my Bresser Messier 12.7i. The bottom of the scope hits the tripod legs at certain angles. Would an extension tube or pier fix this issue? It's on, and then it cuts off because yes. it doesn't uh, like that many okay. characters. So, Connor. Um, my uh, thoughts are typically when there's a leg strike, you simply need to move the telescope farther skyward. In other words, that way, so it's not so long. Leg strikes are not uncommon. Uh, well, they're more uncommon than they used to be, but putting a pier on it introduces other problems as well. Um, it would be, you know, you may have to run into some balance issues if you move it that far forward and get move it that way. Now it may not balance well. If it doesn't balance well, you start putting weight on the back end. I've seen people uh, use bags of lead shot or steel shot. Uh, if there's a place where you can hook a set of, uh, if it's a steel tube, you can hook set a magnet on it. There's all sorts of ways to add weight on the back side, on the IP side, if that's where you're having trouble, Connor. Um, so, if you want to send us a picture of your rig, we'll be happy to take a look at that. You can contact us. The easiest way would be go to our Explore Scientific store and uh, here on Amazon.com, click on Contact the Seller. Send the pictures to uh, uh, Noah and he will get them for you. Uh, Kent, look at the telescope next to you. Do you have a similar cover cap for the reflector with the center hole? Uh, no, typically we don't, Tariq. Um, that's what that's called a field stop. You can make one yourself out of cardboard. They don't have to be perfectly round. They can be square. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's not going to make the stars square. Uh, the telescope is just going to be fine. This is a field stop. And what this is, is if you look at something real bright, you can just put it over. And I always make sure when I do this, see the little angles in there? Just make sure that it's between those legs of the spider that holds the secondary mirror. And voila, you've now cut the amount of light going to the telescope a whole bunch. But you don't know it because it looks perfectly fine in the eyepiece. It's a pretty cool effect. Also, never look at the sun with this telescope, it says. You know why not? You'll put your eye out here. I'm going to show you, though, a way to do it safely. Uh, I like the bickering. Please don't stop. Yeah, thanks, Egon. Don't encourage him. <laughs> don't encourage him, Egon. Don't encourage him. Uh, what? So, this telescope comes with a red dot finder as well as a 25 millimeter super plossal eyepiece, a great eyepiece to get you started. Now, this telescope is mounted on what's called an equatorial mount. There's also a 
Altaz mount, which uh, I've got one over there. I'm not going to get it. It's think left, right, up, and down. Real simple to use. However, the equatorial mount, once you learn to use it, is a whole lot more powerful. You have to get it polar aligned, which means this axis right here has to match the rotational axis of the Earth. How do you know what that is? Real simple. Figure out the latitude you live in. Where here in northwest Arkansas, we're 36 degrees north. So there's a little scale on the side. I just put it at 36 degrees north and then point the telescope to the north. Uh, Egon, hi Kent. I tried to leave a good review with great pics of the new little 60 millimeter with, with the IXOS 100, and my Amazon posts have been blocked. Hmm. That's a Noah thing. Noah, why would that be? Because he didn't buy it through Amazon, maybe? Okay, Egon Noah's doing some research on it. He had sent him a message, and he's trying to figure out why that would be. Amazon, you know, works hard to make sure that we have, uh, you know, that their reviews are legitimate. So it may be related to that. Hey, uh, Amazon having... bots are not, they are not, not, they uh, Osmosis 007. Yeah. Uh, osmosis double absolutely neutral density filters generally get this out will screw in to the eyepiece right here this is an inch and a quarter eyepiece meaning this is inch and a quarter across you get a neutral density filter and just screw it in neutral density filters work well on really bright things especially the moon as it gets more and more towards full the moon can get very bright and that uh, it, it won't hurt your eye, you know, it won't damage your eye. I don't know, eye, man. But when you look into it, sometimes a full moon, or close to full moon, can be so bright that it's like, eh, that's that's really bright. Slightly uh, painful at times. It can be painful at times, absolutely. So uh, you can get a neutral density filter. We do sell them. Um, I don't know if we have them up online or not, but if we don't, you can contact again through the Amazon.com uh, sell, uh, explore scientific store because this is an Amazon broadcast that's going out all over the place uh, so I can't say where else to go to find us uh, so it screws in there and cuts down generally uh, you get they come in like a point nine, so it cuts down a whole bunch of light so you uh, don't get overwhelmed by the brightness obviously the eyepiece goes in there so let's talk real quick about how this telescope works this telescope has an opening right here. The light comes in, comes down unchanged. Right here is a curved mirror. Light hits the mirror, starts going off at an angle. All that starts coming to a get together in a point. And at that point where it comes together, it's called the focal plane. And that's where you use the eyepiece and the focuser to focus inside out, inside, in and out to find the perfect focus for your eye. When viewing the moon, I put it in my star diagonal so I can switch eyepieces on the fly. Great idea. If you have an inch and a quarter diagonal, you can put in an inch and a quarter uh, neutral density filter. Or if you have a two-inch diagonal, you can put in a two-inch neutral density filter. Obviously, the two-inch neutral density filter is going to cost you more than the standard inch, than the traditional inch and a quarter eyepieces. So if you're out there, uh, just join us here on Amazon Live. Click that follow button. We would love to pick up a follow from you. And again, we've picked up uh, Oculus today. Again, we can't say how much we appreciate you uh, because you're sharing your time with us, and we truly do appreciate that very much. So, got another question with, from Tariq with uh, Mac. I don't need neutral density because the Mac takes care of brightness perfectly. Yes, um, when Tariq says Max, he means. Uh, uh, Maxitov Cassegrain telescopes, and they have an inherently long focal length which reduces the brightness of the light. Uh, Tariq, I want to use a refractor for solar imaging, and I want to stop down the aperture. I prefer something done by manufacturer than DIY, and for HI, I won't use a neutral density filter. Tariq, unless you're, as long as you're using a solar safe filter, you don't need to stop it down any at all. It's not required. Uh, and you can't stop down the sun enough to be able to photograph it without a safe uh, 
neutral density filter because when you just keep stopping it down, you're just going to create a pinpoint of incredibly bright light that you're never going to be able to take a, a picture of the surface of the sun with. So if you're using something like our sun catcher solar filters, and Tariq, I know you've seen us talk about this before. The sun catcher, large aperture um, solar filter, is a uh, thousand oaks mylar film that reflects 99 point whatever, uh, nearly all the sunlight that's hitting it. And it has some uh, film in there also that gives it a pleasing yellow uh, orange is color depending on how your eyes look at it. That allows you to see the visible surface of the sun. You're going to see sunspots. It does not allow you to see loops and prominences and things like that. But it if does it, let you see sunspots. And by the way, if you try to cut the sun uh, on after it's gotten into your telescope, all you're doing is concentrating that energy and you're going to it's going to, like a laser, go straight through your head and out the back of your skull. <laughs> it may not be that bad, but it's, not, <laughs> it's going to poke your eye out. It'll, yeah. it'll, it will burn. It will instantly etch your retina and cornea. It will be brutal, and it won't ever go away. My Mac yeah, Wintinson burns my again. eyes on a full moon, Osmosis 007. I'll tell you what. <laughs> it all depends on what kind of Mac you use and how long it is, what, how long the focal length is. But, yeah. 120, you know, big Macs collect like a 152 Mac or a 180 millimeter Max to top cast of grain uh, is concentrating a whole bunch of light, even though it may be a focal length of 1900 millimeters or 2200 millimeters, is still uber bright. What's crazy is the think, moon's color is like, yeah. you know, a couple year old black asphalt, not quite black, and it still, Paul, reflects that much like. Electricity. So I think that much Tariq energy. was talking about HA filters. Uh, okay, for HA, Helium it's a completely alpha. different story. That's why he's saying, yes, um, you know, uh, you're going to have to consult your HA filter provider for that on wh how much, you know, what they need to stop down. I know that uh, I've used both over the weekend, went to a star party Friday night. Uh, outside of a bar, had a great time, multiple hundreds of people uh, looked through our telescopes. Uh, we had a quark, a, I think it's a Daystar quark, energy rejection filter that was really nice. People were, were, you know, in a low power view of the sun, looking at the sunspots. And we also had a hydrogen alpha a double stack. Uh, the guy that, that owns that, uh, Tyler, uh, could not get the uh, tuning exactly right, so he took the double stack off and went with, a, it was like a 70 millimeter telescope. It was not a big telescope, but provides some really awesome views yeah. uh, of the hydrogen alpha region. It wasn't very active, there wasn't much to see. Although, right now folks, there are a ton of sunspots. If you've not gotten into solar viewing, you need to do that. And one really quick, inexpensive yet safe way is, with a sun catcher large aperture solar filter, it comes already assembled in this uh, cardboard yeah. case. And this with is for the film. visual. Yes. That, not, you it's, you, you know, you can't yeah. see hydrogen alpha with right. your this, naked eye. This is for, for straight white light, right? Yeah. We color it yellow so it looks pleasing because it's not just a, uh, you know, it's not just white light. The quark that we were looking at does show white light. So this uh, system, you can order one that fits your telescope. Uh, Osmosis uh, says the moon is totally underappreciated. So much fun following the Terminator shadows uh, in craters. Absolutely, that's the fun part of watching the moon is following the Terminator across the face of the moon uh, as it works its way up to full and then as it goes away from full. That is an awesome uh, thing to watch. What I like is, hello, Kent and all from Mike Overacker. Hey, Mike, thanks for answering that question for me. Truly appreciate it. Uh, and you answered it thoroughly, it appeared. So thank you very much, Mike. Referring to what a question. Mike had, uh, has uh, motorized our 20-inch Dobsonian telescope. Oh, uh, yeah. And he, uh, there was a customer who has bought one and was wanting to put setting circles on it 
so he would be able to use it as a push to and get it in the right spot. Mike gave him a lot of information that I didn't have because Mike had measured it and figured it out uh, by measuring it. So that was a very helpful uh, piece of information that I have now uh, written down and have it in my documentation sheet as well. Again, thank you very much, Mike, for that. Um, if you haven't started solar viewing, you need to start. As I said, the sun catcher, fantastic way to watch that turn or to, to watch the solar viewing, uh, to watch sunspots. There's a bunch. We counted on Friday night 22 sunspots, and that was at low power. There's a bunch of sunspots on the surface of the sun right now, and going to be some. As we go through the next year and a half to two years, we're going to be going to solar maximum. The sun goes through an 11 year cycle of a whole bunch of sunspots. Not very many are nose and no sunspots. So we went for a year and a half or two years without very many sunspots or no sun, sunspots at all. Now we're coming out of solar minimum, working our way up to solar maximum. We'll have tons and tons and tons of sunspots, and they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they'll taper off and go back down to none, and that's the solar cycle. It's an 11-year progression of uh, sunspots. So awesome to watch sunspots. What I like, like about sunspots is it changes. So sunspots get bigger, they grow, they change shape. Uh, you'll be watching uh, You'll be just sun. That's getting a black a sun. Suddenly, you can see the sun. go right here. burn a hole through a filter sunlight that is going to come some video from Scott Um, I wanted to tell you some things about safety. Uh, uh, ISO standard. So, if you're going to, to look at the partial phase, the let me underline partial. You use eclipse glass sun in partial phase. During that time, two minutes this time on. Because it's completely blocked. Corona, you'll see effects that will operation so you shouldn't do what you shouldn't do passes and look through filtered uh, and I'll directly at the sun Turn that up a little bit and look right at the filter through the solar filter material through the solar filter material. Is. So, this is definitely something you, you can now see that there is a filtered telescopes or binoculars. Right into your eye. Binoculars to watch the part, or just to observe the sun. Uh, make sure that you are using 
that has the uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this about to come off you have a loose fitting filter to make sure that the and then the the other thing is uh, optical finder scopes are like little telescopes. In this case, I just have a red dot finder. Find power to it. So, side in the sun is and align the scope and align. Now I can safely. And look at sunspot. And look at what? Gonna do to your mark one. That's gonna do to your mark L eyeball. Having that happen to an eyeball. Mm, boy, question or comment? Question or comment? As a space pirate for Halloween. As a space pirate for eighty, you know, with that, uh, with those. I never joke with the sun, and I never joke with the sun. as I said, who lives in the UAE? Yes, lives in the UAE. Yes. His uh, doctorate in electrical are getting his uh, doctorate in Baghdad, and I'm out of Baghdad, and oof, and uh, yeah, oof, and uh, yeah, I know it's a dry heat, uh, just uh, you know, uh, being that you know, being in that you know, being in that. Uh, Egon. Uh, Egon. Yes, indeed. It, it experienced observer. Uh, experienced. Is it okay if I do this? You know, even though this is a key thing that. that And at some point, when you start playing with your video, you, Tariq, if you came here, Tariq, if you came, absolutely, but you know, is uh, SPF going to be out so, ever? Uh, my son, I always wear a cap. Uh, I umpire youth baseball. I'm always out there with a cap, or the caps I wear might have the mesh in the back, but that's filtered sunlight. It you doesn't need, burn, but you know it doesn't hurt. It's just got a little bit more sun right here I than think it's used to. To visit so, Tariq, you might need an SPF 2000, or um, you can buy some of these Habit Brand shirts that have. This is actually a SPF 40 uh, sunscreen shirt. Buy a long sleeve shirt. And uh, wear a straw cap, and uh, uh, you know you're still going to get your skin. Still going to have to get used to the reflected light. I went light swimming at the lake off. for like um, two hours and didn't get any sun at all with no sunscreen. Well, uh, that must be some good genetics coming out in you, Paul, because uh, I most assuredly. <laughs> can, you know, this is. I mean, I'm out every weekend. That's with sunscreen, right? So. I'm not worried about my arms, but I didn't think about tops of my ears and my head. So sunburned a little bit, not bad. Egon burned a hole in his shirt once. Uh, with a, uh, Tell us I have, I have uh, done that. I was going to do some solar viewing, and I was using the the finder scope to line it up, and uh, took the lens cap off. And somebody, we were at a, a public outreach. Somebody asked me a question. And I was using a, a, a Schmidt-Cassegrain 8-inch telescope. 
and there's a hole in the back, and I just always just plug it with an old black film canister. And I was sitting there, I started going, it smells like burning plastic. I turned around, and I didn't, didn't really couldn't find it. And then I saw a sun projected on the ground and went, uh-oh, and it just melted that black film canister just gone to bits. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, I can imagine, you know, being able to set your clothes on fire or something like that and not realize that if it was a baggy shirt like this, it's, you know, not touching your skin. And, and uh, yeah, I don't want that. So, anyway, how the sun catches They are, the, we've been asked here about <coughs> the shirts. What's the question? What, Paul? Look at the screen. Does Explore sell the 50 FPS shirts? We do not, Egon. Um, we have a link to them in our Amazon carousel. You know, I thought about buying some because I have a source. And, in fact, I, Tyler and I are getting ready to order some that we're going to take and have Explore Scientific it's logos in the put on them. Uh, yeah, but they're not Explore. We're going to get the Explore Scientific logo right here, I think. We might get them on the pocket. We'll go see what the what the... Embroiderer says we can do. Uh, I prefer but, Tommy Bahama oh, myself. These are, I, I like these shirts. They're vented in the back, you know, variety pack colors. Uh, the problem is, Egon, that, um, you know, carrying inventory of every size and every color gets to be pretty expensive, and then they don't move, and then, you know, uh, they get grabbed for somebody needs a shirt for a broadcast, and they don't go back, and they don't come out of inventory, and it just becomes... Uh, um, you it's know, okay. um, yeah. So Tommy Bahama, but, but, you start, but you, know you what? start doing the Tommy if, Bahama shirts and I'll start wearing them. If, uh, uh, if you're interested in getting one of these shirts with an Explore Scientific logo, Fresh. we'll have a better idea of cost, um, probably middle of next week or something like that would be my guess. So. Finishing up about the solar filters. How does See how work? he just ignores how me. How do you make... Just ignores me. How do you me. make, sir? How did I? Go buy I'll, and go buy I'll wear them. them. Talk Rob into it. So yeah. these comes with four of these triangular pieces right here. If I have four pieces of double-sided tape, you'll pull one side of the, of the cover off, stick it down, put your... Square there, put your triangle there, square. Put your triangle Make there, sure triangle that there, thing triangle is there. On tight. And, then, and then you're going to cut these to fit. And how I would do it is take the dew shield and press it down really hard so it makes a little mark. And then cut inside of that mark, right? Because you can always cut more off. But if you get it too loose and it blows off, you don't want to use it because we can sell you more of these things, no problem, but you want to proceed slowly. You want this to be a tight fit like in the video Scott had. He had to work to get that, that on there to get it to stay on. Why? Because you don't want somebody to walk by and just touch and it come off. You wind don't want blows. a big old gust of wind to blow it off. you got to have this thing on tight all the time so it won't come off. I have a question coming up here. Hey, there's Dr. Daniel Barth. Hey. During my solar outreach program, uh, go get a mic. Mic him up, please. Uh, During my solar outreach programs, okay. I've had six he to can, ten we can hear solar him. telescopes. I can, I can get Okay. Close. Yeah, we're <laughs> you're, you're, you're greenish today. And constantly announce that these telescopes are special and make the people repeat it back to me. So I know that they know. Mike, That's I do the same thing. I give the first thing I do is say, you know, if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you want to look at the sun? No, don't do it unless they seem like they really, really, really know what they're doing. And even then, uh, Daniel, you've probably, this is Dr. Daniel Barth. Hi, guys. Um, uh, he has the uh, uh, social media blast for uh, uh, How Do You Know? How Do You Know? And he's talking about, uh, planetary Nebula. Planetary Nebula today. Uh, today. So, um, I always you, told folks to put their hand over the eyepiece, and if you go, ow, or the light's really intense, yeah, yeah. then don't put your face then, there. But if you see people, <laughs> but, but we'll be out doing it, and there'll be you know people after people, person after person do it, and then somebody will come by and they'll go, no, I don't want to. And I'm, Why not? It's, it's fine. It's perfect. No, I'm not going to look at the sun. And although they can see 
10 people ten before, people them, before them. them, yeah, and 10 people after them say no, they still won't do it. Uh, Osmosis 007, since I can never catch the astro astrophotography segments, is there an astrophoto astro photography camera? Uh, thank you for reading. I, I've lost my Designed ability. For Come on, Ken. Cell phone. Um, I will tell you, you can use your cell phone for astrophotography. However, two caveats here. Step in a little bit more. Uh, sure. Uh, two caveats. First of all, um, things that are really bright and impressive, like the moon, work best. You need to have the latest model uh, cell phone to have it sensitive enough to detect this. And uh, a lot of people try this handheld. I want it's to hard. Take a picture. It's, it's hard, hard, but it's doable. Um, I teach my students to do it. Uh, but if you've got a tracking system and uh, Explore sells a amount to affix your camera to mm -hmm. your eyepiece mm -hmm. and you can attach it and if you've got a tracking mount you know you can go ahead but it's going to be like 30 years ago because you can't stack frames you just got to get one long there's, track to there's exposure. actually you know there's actually programs out there you can download on like an iphone i know okay. uh, that you can stack in your iphone that'll actually do it in the iphone technology uh, changes so it, quickly. it does it's because because you know, when you, that's what's happening. You know, I can take a four or five second exposure with my iPhone, right. and it's not blurry or anything because it's actually taking a whole bunch of series of pictures and stacking them up, right. and the ones that are out of alignment, it just rejects, and they're gone. Right. Now, our friend Mike Wiesner, uh, he takes pictures of galaxies and nebula all the time with a smartphone. There's this yeah. weekend. Yeah, I saw that. You posted that on the Facebook. Yeah, I, I, hey, Paul, zoom in here. I don't know if you can zoom in here and no. see this. You can put it down there on top of the sun catcher. Right there? Mm, yeah. Not using the camera on the cell phone, just a camera that you uses to bring Bluetooth to send the images the, to, to your, your phone. Left. Uh, we do not. It's not in focus. Up and left. There you go. There you go. Back up just a touch. Yeah, I'll, I'll, there it I'll, is. I'll give Kent a copy of that to post. Yeah, and this is... Uh, this is a single exposure, handheld, no guiding, and uh, no processing. It's nice and bright. Did you handheld this at the eyepiece? Handheld, handheld at the yeah. eyepiece. And how, and, many, how many did you have to shoot to get this? About eight. Yeah, okay. And I, I shot eight, and I kept, you know, adjusting the parameters. Right. Uh, you go to pro mode so you can make the focus manual so you can control it and you have to keep tweaking and trying and then when you're done for the evening the next morning i went through and you know uh i ripped him down and said this is the best one yeah. but i think i think so, it turned out so os nice. osmosis oh it's beautiful and blows up well Hi, so Paul. i have an answer to this question the Good. sony a7 III and up and the a7 II will send using their program on your phone they will send the image to your phone however you only get the jpeg you do not you get, get the raw the you don't get the raw or the tiff or whatever ARW. i know Ni nikons and cameras nikon and canons will do the same thing right but, but they again, only send the jpeg they're sending the low low quality jpeg they're not sending the high res one um I don't know of any, you know, I don't do a lot, right now I'm not doing any astrophotography, that'd be a question for Tyler. Uh, go find Tyler, <laughs> please. Just telling him what to go do now. Go find Tyler real quick. And we'll Dr. ask Tyler Barth, that question, because he'll know. Kent Mark's slave so Dr. Already. Barth <laughs> works <laughs> for the university, and, and a right good one too, sir. Then he works at the University of Arkansas, Department of Education. He teaches the teaching students how to teach astronomy. And I'll tell you what, Dr. Barth is full of brilliant ideas. Uh, planetary nebula are made up of planetary gears. Ha ha, ha ha, Mike Overacker. Some people won't get that one. I that don't one's, get it. That one's funny. I don't get it at all. Uh, the bush, boss. Yeah, the bush. planetary gears, like in a transmission or a internal power transmission system. Okay. Planetary gears, they're a gear that's inside of another gear. Come on, join the club, buddy. I'm, what I'm what right. is? So, um, where'd the question go? The question is, there you go. Ah, not using a camera. 
on the cell phone, just a camera that uses Bluetooth to send images to your phone. So do you know of astro cameras that, that, are there any astro cameras that have Bluetooth that sends the pictures to your phone? No. I don't the, think I, so. I, They're all wired connections, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And the reason is? Because it's wired connection. No, but why, Dr. Ah, D? Well, <laughs> the, uh, Join us in the, the wired connection He's leaving now. a lot faster. And you stable. Have to, and more Get stable. Out, Tyler. There are DSLRs <laughs> with Bluetooth, and there are DSLRs with uh, options where they will, it's not Bluetooth, it's a different kind of wireless transmission, and they will send a picture to whatever off you know, camera storage you want to. But if you're using a DSLR, then you can just take the little uh, card, the memory card, right. and transfer it anywhere. If you're using, if you're talking about a straight astrophotography camera like the CCD cameras that are just designed for astrophotography, they're really designed to hardwire port into right. a computer and that's Cause, about it. Because there's so much data. I mean, you're talking about 20, 30, 40 megabytes of pictures sometimes. You know, phones today are so spectacular that I wouldn't doubt that there would be some way that you could take that wired connection and get an adapter and yeah. put it right into your phone. You know, Pete, but, uh, uh, okay, thanks for the answer. Thinking I enjoy visual but would like to share some images. I work on cars, another hobby I have, and I have a diagnostic scope that sends to my phone. Neat as heck. Yeah, things like that. Um, I know there's a, um, I've seen like it, Auto parts stores where they plug in the module oh, to do diagnostics, awesome. and you have the app. Those are awesome. I have a a, a borescope, or you know, a, a little camera on, a, on with a 30 foot lead that you can run down into stuff and right. use. When I was when I was doing welding, we checked right. inside of pipes for sugaring on stainless steel. Thing is, with an app, low res. Is, right, low res, low data rate transmission. And they're usually for applications where dropping out a little bit here, there isn't a problem. Isn't a problem. But transmitting an astrophotographical image, uh, yeah. eh, that would ruin the image. So you really you need some kind of a hard connection. Because yeah. those, if I remember correctly, those aren't packet transmissions like the internet uses. They are not. Those are stream. FTP. Right. FTP. Yeah. So there you go. so they just it's a file and it sends the whole file. Correct. Whereas over the internet. It's sending the whole design of the internet was by the military was really straightforward and simple. So if this node very got blown out and we're sending a message to this, we're going to break it up in packets from the Pentagon, or this would be the octagon, from the octagon, and we're going to send a message over here to this station. And we're going to send in a bunch of packets, and it's going to go all different directions right. and end up and there, reassemble and then reassemble at yep. the end. And so, for that method of Bluetooth, just doesn't do that. No. And when we send, when the camera sends a file to your hard drive, it just sends that file Correct. with zeros and ones and zeros and ones. Correct. It's not sending packets. No. The whole idea of the internet was so if a nuclear launch message went out. They could figure out what the message was, right? Even if pieces of the of the network dropped out. Yeah, that's correct. All right, so uh, we got to be careful what we say here. So you're getting ready to talk about Planetary Nebula in an hour. We can't say where or what because we're on Amazon.com. Do we but, have this on our carousel? No, yeah. we don't. Do we have Star Mentor up? Let me see. The new book? It's a brand new book. I don't think. Talk about it because we there can it get. Is. The, there we've it is. got it's it up. On the carousel. Pull the book up. Talk about Ooh, it real got quick. Got it up on the carousel. Paul's giving us to cut it off, but we're going to ignore him for a minute. That's right. Okay, I'm here used we to are, it. folks. Star Mentor. Here, set that on top of that. We've one. been, we've you been. Go. Can't. You're his microphone. I know it. Hang on. We've been talking about this for weeks, folks. This has been uh, more than a year in the writing, and it's been a long process getting out. But I received my copy from the publisher this week, and it's it's all uh, there. Forty plus years. Oh, this is my 45th year in education. So, and most of those teaching astronomy and physics, and I. Put it all into here for you folks. The idea, there's so many people with new equipment that don't know how to use it. They want a mentor. They want somebody to guide them. And there's other people like Kent who are really experienced. And people are asking them, teach me, Kent, teach me, show me the light. And for both the people who want to share their knowledge and the people who are uh, isolated, that is, out of the astronomical community, there's not a club in your town, this is for you. 
There's more than 50 activities here for you, and they're, they ramp up from easy to more difficult. They will teach you how to set up your telescope, how to track, how to find objects, learn the sky. And um, this, this book has over a hundred, this has like 180 illustrations. Just, here, let me just... And uh, many of them are in color. And it's, it's just lavishly, lavishly illustrated. So this is, it just starts at the basics and works your way and through. And works your way up. And works your way up. Yeah. And there's some, there's some no. cloudy night projects here. Right there's, there's one. I'm trying not to break the back of the book right off the bat. No, go ahead. That's my handle and pass it around so people can. So you see that. right there how to use. Um, modeling clay. Modeling clay to make your own craters. To model the surface of the moon. Right. So that when you get out with your telescope. You've now got a better idea of what you're looking at. And, and because of the different colors, you can figure out what happened when. That's right. And you can actually start seeing, maybe not knowing the That's ages, right. but you get the idea of these are younger than those because right. this has ejecta on top of them. And how many times, Ken, have you had people come up to a telescope when you're at an outreach event and say, now what am I looking at? Yeah, the moon. Yeah. Yeah, or and craters. When you bring a little more knowledge to the eyepiece, you mm -hmm. take a lot more value away from it. And uh, this is this is a this is a life's work here, folks. Yeah. This is 40 years of teaching people uh, how to use telescopes, how to do astronomy, and all the basics, all the fundamentals. And it's it's here for you in one volume. I have not read it, but knowing Dr. D and seeing his other offerings, this is worth $31.88 over in the carousel wow. right now. Because uh, the uh, list price is 35, so that's a great deal. Uh oh. Noah, don't tell oh, the don't tell the, the the book owner that we're cutting his deal. No, I, no, no, they, I know. They sell, sell, sell. I, yeah, folks, I'm the author, not the vendor. Right. So whoever is is buying these, <laughs> uh, it's 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 great, and thank you. Uh, but uh, I already sold the book to Springer, so when you buy this and take it out and use it, uh, mostly what you're doing is. Uh, helping me advance the cause of amateur astronomy, right. build my brand, and uh, get more products out there. I'm working on a new book called Begin with Binoculars, yeah. and that's my project for this year. And uh, I'm just, I'm so thrilled with this. This came out. Have you taken out the Tetons? Have I taken out the Teton, new Teton binoculars? No, Probably I have not. not. So no. let's, this is not a self-published book. No, it is not. This is a, a publishing house. Springer Verlag. Springer uh, is a European company based in Germany, and they have offices around the world. And they, this is part of the Patrick Moore Practical Astronomy Series. For those of you who are familiar with uh, astronomy outreach, Sir Patrick Moore was a, he was the British Carl Sagan. I think I can say yeah, that. Yeah. He was a very yes. popular, uh, popularizer of science and advocate What show did he have? He had a show, I can't. What was his show? It was in the UK for years, yeah, for decades. I can't. Some the later years, it, it came over here for a while before he passed. I remember he had a show. I can't remember what I've seen his shows right. before. So, so Springer I publishes. I propose that if someone buys the book and has seen you on here, they may contact us, and we might be able to set it up to where you can autograph it for them. If They'd have to send it here and we send it back. But yeah, we as, long as, as long that. as uh, Scott and company are, are good with it, anybody is... No cost shipping both ways. Yeah, yeah, basically send it with a self-addressed stamped envelope. But even more. Right? So I can sign it, put it back in the envelope, drop yeah. it in the post for you, and give me some hint about what you'd like. Because I, I have kind of a strange sense of humor. How I would sign a book for Scott or for... Kent might be completely different from how you'd like your sign. <laughs> yes. But uh, I, I would we had be, be happy Mike to sign Overracker, He's asking that. Yeah, so that's question. how we could do it. Um, we have them here. Um, if you order one, hey, uh, Noah, are those FBA or FBS right now? Those are not sold by us. Okay, not sold by us at all. So we would have to... You'd have to send it to us. Yeah, you have to buy it, get it, mail it to us, and then we'll mail it back right. to you. We send can work yeah. that out. Explore and store here in talk, talk to one of us. Yes. You know, yes. Since, I'm on customer service. since I'm on Amazon, I have to say it this way. Okay. Go to Amazon.com to the, Amazon, Amazon the Explore Scientific Store on Amazon.com. 
click uh, contact seller, send Noah a message, and Noah will uh, tell you how to go about getting Absolutely. the book here and get it back. Because we can't just have a book just appear. No. Yeah, it, you know, it just, we get so much mail in boxes. No. We don't want that. So, uh, also, if you do buy it here on Amazon Live, get the book, read the book, come back, and give it a review. Please. That goes for any product you buy here on Amazon Absolutely. That's so important. Live. Reviews so are important. hugely important. Uh, obviously, you know, we're, we, we, we like good reviews. We but can't, you know, but an honest reviews. People aren't entirely happy. Helps us improve products. Correct. And helps me as an author improve my product. Education and outreach is my product. And when I hear from people who are using my stuff and my work and my, uh, my activities and they say, oh, Doc, what about this? And I saw this and I didn't understand it. Or I saw this and what's the next step? Um, and anyone who has... Uh, Questions reading the book is welcome to contact me. I don't know, is it kosher to give out an email on here? No, Probably. we can't no, do we it. Can't. Uh, so go to the Amazon information bots. for me is actually in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Amazon bots are really, really finicky and they okay. don't care. And so they'll kick people off. We, we, we no, have don't products. Want you, we don't want you, we, don't we want can't you. send yeah. we can't we send people that. off of the website. Oh, right. To contact well, us. Let me or give a good else. example. Contact for me is in the book. So you yeah. buy Let the book. Let me give a good example. We have, it's so weird. We have products that are taken off of Amazon from time to time because they say we are selling pesticides. Yeah. There's so what one? Pesticides? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Telescopes. Oh, I can't yeah. sell it because it's a I've, pesticide. I've zapped an ant with a magnifying glass in my day when I was 10 or 11. But <laughs> Science. I, science. Yeah. That's not, I don't know so, if that's pesticide. That's mm. why we have to be so careful on yeah. Amazon yes, because it's the algorithms and don't you, care. They have you, no feelings. No, and no, and it's very nice of them to host us, and yeah. we want to we want to be a, a, a good guest and, and ha, follow yeah. their rules. And you can't argue with an algorithm. Nope. There's no one to talk to. All right, so run over a little bit. I'm glad you came in so we show you a book. Get the book. Read it. You're going to learn something that's going to help you in your outreach. 100% guaranteed. Um, it's well thought out. As I said, he, all the education students at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville take a Dr. Barth class or two learning how to teach astronomy to whatever age group that they're in. I and, train mostly K-8 educators, but okay. occasionally uh, people who teach older kids. Right. So you will learn something, and you, you will. will you will up your outreach game. Dr. Barth talked about, you know, building the brand. Look, as amateur astronomers, our brand is amateur astronomy. That absolutely right? is. And this will help you build the brand of amateur astronomy right there. And I've, I've always said, Kent, and, and you know this is true, the telescope is a party in a box. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, go, you go set up your, your telescope in your driveway, and you're looking at the moon, you're looking at Saturn, you're going to draw a crowd. People what? will literally pull their cars over coming down your street. Is that a telescope? Can mm -hmm. I have a go? And they come up, will you teach me? What am I looking yeah, at? How yeah, can I see this? Yeah. Is this different? What's the magnitude? So, so, Immediately the questions start so, bubbling so out. We had a couple, man and woman, that came down from Springfield, sure. close to Springfield, up close. It doesn't Missouri. matter. Missouri. And uh, they knew the store was here. And their anniversary was Friday, and she wanted to come down and buy her husband. He was Ooh. interested in astronomy, and she wanted to buy a, a telescope and a mountain. What are they going to need? And getting their budget together. And I said, oh, well, you know, hey, if you, we're going to have um, NWA Space, the nonprofit I'm board I'm on with Dr. Barth, we're going to have a, 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 a observing at a bar in uh, downtown Bentonville, Arkansas. And, you know, you can go eat a, at Wright's Barbecue. And come on by, and she's like, "Yeah, we'll do that." So they went to Crystal, they went to Walmart Museum, and I don't think they went to Crystal Bridges, but then they showed up and uh, looked at the sun, and she was buying it for her husband, right? She is Look got set, didn't it? Deep and hard, brother. She was like, "Oh my gosh, that's the," and we were talking about it. And then the moon came up, and we got the 16-inch knob out and put it on the moon. And she messaged me uh, on Saturday going, okay, that star party you're talking about in Arizona, when is it because we're going to come, right? She was hooked and had, had, had just been, eh, you know, 
and she, she was sort of interested, but she left there inspired by looking through a couple of telescopes. And we had people literally who were driving down the road. It's in a residential sure. slash bar industrial area. And there are people who would, you see them looking and they'd go down and park and come walking back. People ride, it's a biker bicycle. Can't call it a biker's bar because it's a bicycler's. Cycler's bar. It's a cycler's bar and restaurant. Really good food and uh, called the Meteor Cafe. They'd go riding back, and you'd see them pull a U-turn and come back, you know? Yep. And it was awesome. It was just absolutely awesome. Yep. We were there until midnight. I'm sure. Pekka night. says hi, by the way. Who does? Pekka. Hey, Pekka, how are you? Here's Pekka. There, howdy, Kent and Daniel. Howdies. Howdies back at you, Pekka. Uh, you know, for those of you who have not maybe been seeing the broadcast before, this is a global audience. Today we've had, I know people from... Uh, Dubai, Dubai, not Dubai, Sweden, UAE. Um, not yeah, not Dubai. UAE, Sweden, uh, all over the United States. I haven't seen anybody I know from anywhere else. But a truly global audience, and this is the cool part about. It. All right, last comment, uh, and then we're going to have to go. Uh, I'm Pekka. Dr. Bar's books immediately. Uh, if he could send them private posts, not company, that way I would skip the unnecessary taxes. Uh, uh, Pekka, we'll talk. We'll talk. We got you, buddy. We'll we'll fix you up. Oh my god! But uh, we'll talk off off the show. And I'm gonna I'm gonna address your other question you emailed me about today on my mm. show later. So that'll mm. be fun. All right. But this, you know what? I'll be I'll be willing to put it out there, hands down. This is going to be the best guide to introductory astronomy you've ever seen. You wanna. People who already own a telescope, and you know the fatigue sets in after, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Here you go. Somebody comes up and says, oh, but I have this telescope, and now my neighbor's 12-year-old kid is asking me to teach him. What do I do? Here you go. Somebody says, oh, we have a club. We want activities to do on our outreach. Here you go. You're a school teacher, and you're planning activities that will engage hands and minds, both in the classroom and out under the dark sky this is I wrote this for you. I wrote right. it for y'all. We gotta go. Okay, um, we have to get out of here. Um, uh, Osmosis 007. I know I saw a message pop up. We've got to go. No time to answer it because we gotta get the studio reset for Dr. Dita there you go. Uh, to get going here at four o'clock. Uh, so ask next time if you get on, and we will go from there. Everyone, thank you very much for sharing your time with us because it's an honor to see how many. It truly is. How many people are willing to give us their time to participate in How Do You Know and Global Star Party in First Light Chronicles, On the Wing, and Focus Amazon on Live. Astrophotography, and on Amazon Live. We truly appreciate we do. your time uh, because you know what? Our brand is Amateur Astronomy. You're part of our brand. We're part of Amateur Astronomy. Everybody that gets into it helps everybody else. That's right. With that, on behalf of everybody else here at Explore Scientific and Dr. Barth, as well as Paul Newton, the disemboweled voice, excuse me, the disembodied voice. He's not disemboweled anymore. And uh, uh, hey, Noah, wave to okay. the camera. Here's what it looks like today. He waved with his right hand today, not his left, and we're going to get out of here. I'm he Ken has Mars. much Bye, more everybody. hair than you. He has much more hair than he you. He does, but I have a lot of hair. I just... Get a burr every three weeks. All right. Bye. Out of here. Bye. Bye.
National Geographic CF600PM telescope lets you explore the intricate contours of lunar terrain or the brilliant clusters of Pleiades. Use the red dot finder to accurately line up this entry-level scope with the alt azimuth mount and tripod to begin your journey into the world of amateur astronomy. The 90-degree diagonal mirror assembly makes viewing comfortable and the built-in storage trays keep your two included eyepieces safe and secure. The easy-to-use telescope lets you see clearly with an aperture of 50 millimeter with a 600 millimeter focal length. And the unique carbon fiber styling of the CF600PM gives this scope a modern rugged edge. Use the included online astronomy software and star map with the National Geographic CF600PM telescope to begin your journey to exploration of the stars. Thank you for watching our 24-hour-a-day live stream here at Explore Scientific, where we show you all the programs that we run live in front of a live audience. Programs like Global Star Party, On the Wing for Birders, First Light Chronicles for Beginners, and Focus on Astrophotography for Astrophotographers. We bring in astronomers and explorers from around the world to answer your questions live. But there's so much cool information there that we decide to package it all together and run it 24 hours a day. We're also on Amazon Live, uh, where we do deep dives into our products and our gear. There's so much important information as we share the education, the experience, answering questions from the audience, that kind of thing. So tune in, and thanks for watching. Hi, everybody. It's Mike Hatch with Explore Scientific. Today, we're going to show you exactly how to collimate your refractor telescope. What you're going to need is a Cheshire eyepiece, a hex wrench, and a flashlight. So collimation is the alignment of the lens cell on the end of your telescope. The lens cell is what's holding those optics in, so you want to make sure those are aligned and centered to give you the best performance out of your telescope. Now looking at our board here, we've got two examples. One of a collimated telescope and one that is out of collimation. By looking through your Cheshire eyepiece, you're going to be able to see crosshairs or circles depending on the design of your Cheshire. A collimated telescope is going to have one solid crosshair right in the middle of that lens cell. An out of collimation telescope, you're going to see multiple crosshairs that are out of the center. Your goal is to bring those crosshairs into the center to create one bold crosshair. So this is our Cheshire eyepiece and you can find these across the web and order one at any range of price. Now you will install this into the back of your telescope into the focuser. You're then going to snug your tensioned collar to hold this in place and you want to make sure that it's nice and flush against the end of that focuser to ensure an accurate collimation reading. Once it's installed in the back of the focuser you're going to take your flashlight and shine it right through the top of that opening, like so. And there's then going to be a peephole in the back of the Cheshire, and that's how you will view the position of your collimation. Now, to understand the front of your telescope a little bit better, you will see three to four groupings of two screws around the front of your lens cell. One is your adjusting screw, and one is your locking screw. The one on the right is your locking screw, and you'll see that it's sticking out a little bit farther than the adjusting screw. Now to start your collimation process, you're going to loosen this locking screw very slightly, anywhere from a quarter to half a turn. Then you will then be able to adjust your adjusting screw to achieve perfect collimation. Here we have two examples, one of a collimated lens cell and one that is out of collimation. The collimated lens cell, you can see there's one solid crosshair in the center of the optics. The out of collimation, you will see anywhere from two to three crosshairs that are out of place, not in the center. So our goal is to bring those in and stack them on top of each other to create that one solid crosshair. 
Now, after you've loosened your locking screw slightly, you are then going to evaluate the position of the out of place crosshairs. You are then going to find the adjustment point that is opposite of those out of place crosshairs. You will then adjust your adjusting screw, snug up your, all the locking screws around the lens cell, go back to your Cheshire eyepiece and evaluate your collimation. If it's still out of place, you'll go back to the front of the lens cell, you'll loosen up those locking screws, do your adjustment on your adjusting screw, and go back to the Cheshire and repeat the process as necessary. And don't forget to lock it. That will ensure that your collimation will stay in place after it's been achieved. Thanks for watching, guys. That is exactly how you collimate a refractor telescope. So if you run into any problems or have any questions, go ahead and call our 800 number or reach out to our customer service through email and they'll be able to help you with any of your needs. Discover the inner beauty hidden inside common rocks with the Explore One Rock Tumbler Set. The set mimics natural weathering processes, and in a matter of weeks, the tumbler can turn rough-edged rocks into smooth, shiny stones, showcasing intriguing colors and patterns. Junior geologists can start immediately with the included selection of stones and will love seeing the everyday rocks they've collected transformed into shiny works of art. And the learning continues by investigating rock composition and learning about geological processes. Turn learning into art with the Explore One Rock Tumbler. Hey, this is Tyler with Explore Scientific. Welcome back to this wonderful series we're going to have on Explore First Light. Today we're going to talk about mounts. What, what, what mount do we want to use them for? Either German Equatorial, an alt as mount, or a go-to system, which are these two over here. Today we're going to discuss the German Equatorial mount. Now with the German Equatorial mount, it is greatly advised that you always point these mounts north, towards the North Celestial Pole. That way you can get a, a decent polar alignment, and that way you can track the said object with our slow motion control knobs in the RA axis, which is the top axis right here. So you'll line up with the said object, we'll just use the moon for reference, and the deck, and then we'll just sit there and rotate back and forth to the object in just one direction. The next mount is our alt as mount. Now with this particular mount, it doesn't matter with polar alignment. You can just plop it on the ground, slew to said object, left, right, up, down. This is the, the deck or the left, right, up, down version. And here is the east to west, north and south. Next, we're gonna actually go with our go-to systems. This is our IXOS 100, and this is his bigger brother, the XOS 2 PMC8. Both can be controlled with Android tablets or Apple tablets. We have what is called the Explorer Stars app within the said systems, one in the box here and one in the controller here. Now, you can use the Explorer Stars app to do Messier objects, IC objects, or deep sky objects as well. I hope this explains a brief introductory of our mounts, and I hope to see you in the next video. We're also gonna be talking about Newtonians next. I hope everybody has clear skies and keep looking up. Thank you for watching our 24 hour a day live stream here at Explore Scientific, where we show you all the programs that we run live in front of a live audience. Programs like Global Star Party, on the wing for birders, first light chronicles for beginners, and focus on astrophotography for astrophotographers. We bring in astronomers and explorers from around the world to answer your questions live. But there's so much cool information there that we decide to package it all together and run it 24 hours a day. 
We're also on Amazon Live, uh, where we do deep dives into our products and our gear. There's so much important information as we share the education, the experience, answering questions from the audience, that kind of thing. So tune in, and thanks for watching. Are you having a hard time trying to figure out what telescope to get? Don't worry guys, Tyler here with Explorer Scientific is gonna help you figuring out what you're wanting to do, either astrophotography or visual. I always tell customers that telescopes is, it's kind of like golfing, it's, it's carpentry, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hobby that you have to learn specific tools in what they do, because these are tools, I consider them as tools and they have a specific purpose in what you're wanting to do either visually or astrophotography. First, we're gonna talk about this little beauty, the Maxudov Cassegrain. Great for planets, so if you are wanting nothing but planets, this bad boy is the way to go. If you're wanting some deep sky objects in some planetary, the, the uh, reflector right here from Explorer First Light is also the way to go. But if you just want deep sky objects, if you want wide, wide field of view, a refractor is the way to go. These are just a couple of basics here at the Explore First Light series. The Maxudov Cassegrain, the Newtonian, and the Refractor. All of these scopes come with a red dot finder, a smartphone adapter to get you started in astrophotography, as well as an eyepiece, and whichever mount that you want to choose with the combination of telescope you want. If you need help out there on Amazon, don't be afraid to reach out through the live chat. We'll make sure that we get back with you as soon as we can here at Explore Scientific. Hi, I'm Tyler and welcome back to our Explore First Light series. Today we're going to talk about the Newtonian and specifically this is a 114 millimeter Newtonian with a four and a half inch mirror. How these Newtonians work is light will enter through the main objective, bounce off the primary, hit the secondary and goes right into our diagonal or our rack and pinion with an eyepiece or our cell phone adapter. This has 40 millimeters of draw tube and now all these telescopes come with a red dot finder, a 25 millimeter Palossal, and a cell phone adapter. Now with these particular first light telescopes, they always come with a couple of options as far as mounts. The EQ3, a nano mount, a Twilight One, or an Alt As mount. Now with these particular telescopes, it is always recommended that you get multiple eyepieces. And I always recommend the 52 degree series that we see here, also with a focal extender. Usually two times is plenty enough. Now with these eyepieces, they are waterproof and argon purged, and they make a perfect addition to these telescopes to help you visually acquire what you're wanting to see. Now again, I hope you guys tune in for our next episode. We're gonna be talking about our 80 millimeter refractor on the First Light series. And again, my name is Tyler, and I hope you have clear skies and keep looking up. products. I tried to get Tyler Bowman to help me, but he's a little grumpy today. So he's not here. So. All right. So if you're out in the Amazon world, please give us a shout out. I want to know that you're out there. I want to see who's watching. I like to talk to you guys and let me fix my TV real fast. And so anyways, so here at Explore Scientific, we have quite a few things that are geared towards children and that a teenage age range. And so, uh, so anyway, so I wanted to show you some fun things that we have uh, for kids. Uh, so here we go. So the first thing I'm going to show you is our nature, water, and land habitat. 
This I really like. Uh, it has a um, magnifier on the top, which you can take off. So there's a magnifier on the top. Um, so when you when you put whatever it is in there, you can see down in it and get a close up uh, view of whatever you have captured. Make sure that you re make sure that you uh, release whatever you capture. Then this comes right off, as you can see. And there's air holes in there, so whatever it is that you that you have found um, and want to observe for a little while can still get oxygen. Uh, the great thing about this um, a, um, product is that it is a land and water habitat, so you could take it down to the creek, lake, river, whatever you want to, and scoop you up something out of the water and see what you can find. Uh, so, so there's there's the obviously the bucket. Uh, then it comes with. This wonderful net. I think it would be fun to catch fish with this, uh, to try to catch fish with this at the river or the creek or whatever. Maybe the ocean. Make sure you hold on to this. Do you think you could catch little things at the ocean? I don't know. I'm used to having somebody talk with me, but today I'm by myself. <laughs> Anyways, so I have this, and then we have little tweezers to pick up things. Now, be careful when you're picking up insects. Some insects are can be um, can be poisonous, so we so we always recommend that you make sure that you try to identify whatever it is you're picking up before you pick it up. Um, one time, I had a one of the world's deadliest caterpillars on my front door when I went out the door, and it looked really cute and fuzzy. And then we tried to figure out what it was and went, oh. I guess we shouldn't touch that. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so make sure that you try to identify whatever it is that you're capturing. And I'm going to screw this back on here just for the fun of it. So you can carry that around. It has a wonderful handle. Um, and then, of course, it comes with an additional magnifier. It has um, a magnifier here, and then it has um, a higher magnification um, right here in the bottom. Let's see if I can tell you. It says two times to four times magnification. <laughs> Grumpy man has arrived. Anyways, two times to four times magnification so you can get up close to those things that you want to observe. This would be great if, let's say, like I said, you found a caterpillar that you didn't know what it was. You could look at it this way, look at it with this, try to identify it, and then if you wanted to keep it or try to capture it and keep it for a little bit than you can. Um, I think we have a, um, don't we, <laughs> don't we have a, uh, don't we have a video on this, uh, Paul? Oh, I'm sorry, my, my screen's not working. It's not working over here, so that's why, because it shows focus on astrophotography from August 19th, 2022. <laughs> So, anyway, so this is our nature, land, and water habitat. Oh, we got kicked. Oh, we're still on Facebook, so there we go. Okay, so this is our nature, land, and water, <laughs> water habitat. Here we go, and we are back on Amazon Live. So... This is our nature, land, and water habitat. Um, it's a great, a great little thing to keep around, uh, to take your kiddos outside and to explore and find and find things. This is for ages six and up. But obviously, if you are, um, if you if you have parent supervision, then you can also do a little younger. So. Uh, yes, a lot of other people need supervision around here. It's fun. We like to be silly around here. Okay. Second, now that I'm done with that, let me move this. No, 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 don't worry about that. I'm, ge I'm getting out the metal detector. And then I'm going, and then I'm going to find some, some um, still headed person. Okay, so. <laughs> so, anyways, this is our Explorer 1 metal detector. It will. Oh, can you hear it? Metal? Yeah, that's detecting the rebarb. The what barb? Rebarb. 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 I want to call it barb. <laughs> rebar. It's yeah. It's <laughs> they all know you're here now. So this is Tyler, my grumpy, my grumpy assistant. Who can't see you sitting on the screen? 
He can't fit in the screen. It's because you're short and I'm tall. You're short and I'm tall? You're short. I'm you're tall. short and I'm tall. This is our case. <laughs> this is our Explore Hut camp. This is our Explore. You could you? You were camouflaged. Just camouflaged. 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 So this is our, uh, Tyler came in in our Explore Hut, uh, Camo Explore Hut. These are really great for kiddos. Um, we, had a, we had a little girl come in yes, mm -hmm. day before, yes, no, yesterday. Yeah, day before yesterday. Was it? A, mm -hmm. No, today is Mon. Today is Tuesday. Oh, so it was. Nice. Yeah, it was yesterday. <laughs> it was yesterday, yeah. and she was climbing all through our explore huts. I have to. <laughs> it's detecting your eyelids. <laughs> okay. Anyway, <laughs> squirrel. Squirrel. squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. Anyway, so um, so we have these we have these explore huts in quite a few different things. We have a haunted house. Got a cupcake. A cupcake truck. Girls cupcake. People can't see your face. I don't want people to see my face. See, they can see. No, they can, like they can see. School bus. They can see my face like this. They have a school bus. A school we bus. Have a rocket ship. We actually have a rocket ship as well. And Paul's got a wonderful video loaded. Yeah, look. So, so we have lots of fun. Now he brought my. He's leaving now. So he was bringing in my Explore Hut. He was actually crawling around on the floor in my explore, in my explore hut, but um, you can see we have a rocket ship, we have a we have a castle, we have a princess castle, we have um, a haunted house, we have a skid steer, we have a can we have a camo tent, we have um, I'm trying to think of everything, a bus, a cupcake truck. There's so many options. So if you go over to uh, our Amazon page, you can see all those explore huts on there and pick you out one for a kiddo. They're really cool because. Great reading nooks or just uh, uh, imagination. You can just spend some time just having fun. Kiddos can, you know, it, it makes their imagination grow. Uh, we also have some that have the tops. The top is open on them. And so if you, if you want to take it out at night and maybe do some stargazing, you can do that as well. Um, just a little nice little nook for them to be able to do, to do that kind of stuff and um, see the stars at night without any extra light coming through. So, but uh, yeah, we had a little girl come in and she absolutely loved this in and out, in and out through it. She was not even, she had to be between two and three um, years old. And and so this is for ages three and up. Uh, great thing to have around. You can, my, my son, every time he comes here, he tries to pick one out, or he does actually pick one out. Um, and so we, we put him in a cubicle with it, and he, he has a fun time in there. So we put toys and stuff in there for him, and he enjoys that. So, yeah, that's our Explore Hut, our Camel Explore Hut that you can see. Um, that's why I couldn't see Tyler, because it was camouflaged. Or or he was just out of frame. <laughs> so yeah. So anyways, um, back to our uh, metal detector. This is our Explore One metal detector. It detects precious metals, obviously, down to six inches below the surface. Yeah, he's on the floor. Oh, you have me on the floor? See, it keeps going the rebarb. It. Bar. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Paul doesn't like me saying that. Okay, so yeah, so there's metal in the concrete, obviously, and then it detected the eyelets on my shoes. Um, we've uh, in the past had some coins down. It'll de it'll detect that as well. It has a bright LED light right here that you can turn on, and you'll be able to see you'll be able to see at night if it's getting a little bit dusk. It can also, I believe, it is water. It has a water resistant cool, which mean coil. I'm sorry, which means that this portion can go into a puddle, but you can't submerge the whole thing in water. So um, if you want to go down to the creek or the lakeside or whatever and do some uh, metal detecting with it, then you can. So, um, so yeah, that's our, and the little flashlight comes off. So you can have that to do things with as well. And I think I'll do one more thing since I've done those three things. And that was really fast because Tyler brought that Explore Hut in. Okay, so now we've got the, we did the Nature Habitat, which is a great thing to go out and just explore during the daytime. Then we have that camo, the Explore Hut, camo hut that we, that I showed, um, obviously can fit Tyler in it, kind of, sort of. Um, <laughs> and then we have a metal detector. Uh, huh? And the clubhouse. You know, the... Uh, 
and then the cupcake truck. You know, it's really cool because the castles, the castles are pretty big. I don't think you have a video of those, but um, we have the princess castle and the regular castle. Um, it's, it, they're, they're really, they're really big. So if you have a child that's a little taller, a little bigger and wants to, wants to have fun in that, then you, you can. These ones pretty much fit. I think my, my son's five. He comes up to about here on me and he usually fits in all of these tents. Um, so they're, they're pretty good. Um, they're pretty good size and uh, roomy and comfortable for them to hang out in and do fun stuff in. So, uh, I know, I'm sorry, I forget. No stripes. Okay, this is our National Geographic. What size is this? I forget. Oh, here, let me get the box. 50 millimeter. <laughs> it's our 50 millimeter tabletop as azimuth mount telescope. So it, it's a, this is a great, like I was saying, the Explore Huts. Um, so, sorry about that, guys. Um, some, uh, like, like I was saying, some of the Explore Huts have, um, have open, the uh, tops of them are open. Um, we actually have a two-room observatory tent here for adults that um, you can put your telescope in. Um, the same thing, is the same concept with an Explore Hut. You could do the same concept with the child, um, put a telescope in there and do some stargazing at night with them. Um, this is a really small, compact uh, telescope that's easy for um, little hands to carry around. This is for ages six and up. So it's a great starter telescope to be able to sit on a table, sit on the ground, then get down, get, be at their height, and then be able to look through it. Um, it comes with a 12.5 millimeter eyepiece, and then it also comes with a 20 millimeter eyepiece. So whenever you're doing a telescope, um, you want to make sure that you start with the highest magnification, I'm uh, sorry, the lowest magnification eyepiece, which is going to be that 20 millimeter eyepiece. You will put that in there, and then you'll point it, point it wherever you want it to go. And like I said, this is an azimuth adjuster telescope, so I got to, so you screw, unscrew this and the locking lever and it'll go left and right. And then you'll unscrew this locking lever and it'll go up and down. So it's really easy to use, um, really lightweight, and really compact. Uh, so yeah, so you can take that wherever you want to. Start off with that that higher magnif. I'm sorry, lower magnification eyepiece, uh, larger number, uh, lower magnification. I know that's backwards, but that's the way it works. You'll put that eyepiece in, point it where you need it to, moon whatever, um, and then you'll just slowly work that in and out and get it into focus. It has a little lens cap, so you can take that off. And it has, a, the dew shield doesn't move, but it has a dew shield to try to, to help keep that uh, dew, off, dew off your lens cell. So it's, it's easy to just fold up and take with you. You can also, I think this little guy comes out, but I'm not quite for sure how. I have not messed with this. This is the first time I've messed with it. No, it actually is attached straight to it, so you don't ever lose your telescope. That's nice. So it all comes together. So if it bear, you know, if you have a little little one that's messing with it, it's playing around with it, then you don't have to worry about pieces getting lost or um, you know your telescope being in one spot and the tripod being in another. So the really good um, lightweight. I mean, I want to get that for my son. <laughs> no, I want to get that for my son now. Okay, so it, it's you can obviously do uh, well. Uh, so refractors are great because you can do uh, terrestrial viewing and uh, land and oh my gosh, my brain. <laughs> you can do sky viewing and you can look at animals as well. So this this telescope will allow you to look at birds, you know, stuff in the woods. Just if you're if you've got a back deck and you've got you know you've got some woods behind you and you're just wanting to see what's out there, this is um, this will be a good little telescope to have around. That's 50 millimeter aperture. The focal length on it, um, let's see, I'm going to tell you, is 360 millimeters, which is a really good focal length to have. Um, the other the other nice thing too is you could. You could. We have them. Um, we have Barlow's, two times Barlow's that you could um, plop on there, and that'll increase that magnification on your eyepiece, so you can th see things a little bit up closer. 
uh, let's see, it's an 18 by 28 8 times magnification. So it's got that good magnification for you to be able to see things up close um, and personal. And you can even see the moon with it, which is always a big hit with little ones. So, um, so between this, you know, if I was going to get a package set for my kid, I would definitely do an explore hut with a telescope or a explore, an explore hut with a pair of binoculars, and that's going to that's going to really increase um, their exploration in our world. And so you would have some, you can take them out, spend some time with them. Uh, just kind of listening to what they're hearing and looking and um, it, what a great time to just sit and be in the moment with them and have fun and do some exploring and having, having some adventure. And you can do that from your own backyard. You don't have to go far off, you know, miles, miles away. Um, you can do that from your own backyard with them. And so that would be a fun thing to have. Now the nature habitat, you could, if you have a, a vegetable garden or just your backyard, wherever trees and shrubberies and stuff, finding animals, or, or sorry, insects to put in there, or like frogs and stuff like that. You can keep those around as well. Um, so I think right now here in Northwest Arkansas, I was seeing that uh, silkworms are a big thing. Um, so we <laughs> actually had somebody post on a Facebook page, hey, um, I need, if y'all want some caterpillars, come get them. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so you can um, also keep caterpillars in that nature habitat as well. And I don't know what else to talk about. You have other products. I do have other products back here. <sighs> I don't have a magnifying glass. Because I don't have, oh, I have this. We haven't talked about this in a while. I'm just talking too fast today. I'm like Speedy Gonzalez. Paul's not liking my jokes. <laughs> Galileo scope it's a DIY project um, it is it is a great product to have to teach to teach a child about um, how a telescope works it comes with the lenses you literally build it from the ground up so I'm gonna do that today I don't think we've had this I don't think we've shown I don't think we've shown this in a while so it has its uh, yes I know we have it has its OTA here's the OTA on it I'm going to set this off to the side. And this, this is a true telescope. It really does work. Uh, so, but you just have to put it together. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get the lenses out. So when you're, so when you're getting your lenses out to, t to put them in, you want to make sure that they are in here correctly. Um, one side will be uh, concave and one side will be curved. So we want to make sure that we put that in the appropriate way. So you can just fill on those with it and always use tissue paper when touching your lens, your lenses. So we're going to put that there and then we're going to put this here. And then we are going to put, I need the rings to hold it together. Mm. A G scope. G scope. So these are these these little rings will hold this together. There's a ridge right here. So you'll just slide this on. Put it right here. Great. It's over in that carousel if y'all want to check that out. It looks like I'm missing a larger ring for some reason. Oh, wait. I didn't get it out. But wait. There's more. The one thing I did not put in here is the uh, nut for the tripod. So that's the only thing that I forgot to put in. On the bottom down here, there's a place for you to be able to mount it onto a tripod. So you can have a little... So you're not having to hold it the whole time looking, which can get a little tiresome after a while. Okay, so now I've got those on there. The next thing I want to do is I want to I want to build our draw tube. So, and Kent took out the instructions, so I have to try to wing it a little over here. Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> so here's our draw tube. So we're going to take another ring. We're going to stick it here. Looks like we left the eyepieces together. That's great. 
so we don't have to try, I don't have to try to put those together. This will slide right in. This will go here. Wait, I might be wrong. Hang on. This goes in first, maybe. I'm trying to get it in there. <laughs> Sorry. I think I have it in backwards, though. I feel like I've got something. Lucy and I have done this a million times, and I don't. I guess I'm just forgetting. I think it goes on the other end. You think it goes on the other end? No, because that's where the lens is at. This is the draw tube. What are you doing? I'm putting it in here. Break it. I'm not going to break it. Let's see. It goes right here. Well, what do you need my help for? <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> you asked what I was doing. I'm trying to tell you what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so here's the draw tube, finally. I just had to get it down in there. <laughs> so there's our draw tube. Um, let's slide it out. Hang on. Let me slide it out. I'm going to slide this little sucker down here. I should have put that on first. That's what I was supposed to do. But we will improvise. <laughs> all right, so there's our draw tube. So once you get it all together, you can put your dew shield on. You have a dew shield. You have a place for a tripod. You come with, it comes with a barlow and an eyepiece. So you just slide that eyepiece in there. You slide that eyepiece in there, and then you'll be able to um, get that into focus uh, by pulling that, that draw tube in and out. Um, and then, of course, it comes with a barlow, which is not put together, so I'm sure i got lenses somewhere on here. But it's really cool because the lenses, they come, up, they come in little pieces, so you can... I don't fill them in here. So you can, you actually, the instructions will tell you how to put them together, concaved um, and flat, uh, concaved and curved. And so you'll put those lenses together. You'll put one, you'll put a set in the front, a set in the middle, and then you'll be able to use that eyepiece. Um, this is one of our uh, Explore Alliance ambassadors right now showing you how to put it together. Um, those are the lenses that you can see. It's, her name is Libby in the stars, and she is an amazing an amazing astronomer um, and so so she came in and did that for us recorded that for us